Madame l'ambassadrice, chère Catherine Colonna, cher Théodore Veldin, euh, cher euh, Trustees and Patrons, Monsieur le Président du Trust, Ladies and Gentlemen, dear guests of the night, it's a pleasure and an honor to welcome you tonight here at the French Institute for a night of ideas, whose debate will be echoed throughout the world in 90 countries and 190 cities. At this crucial time of such challenging issues for all societies and countries, cultural institutes like ours, dedicated to the exchange of ideas, to culture, to education, and to innovation, will ask together, what does it mean to be alive? The Institut Francais in London has always insisted upon being an important place of debate. It is also a place for discussion without borders. And I wish to say that I am proud and moved to see that so many British and other European partners are present tonight with us on the very eve of an historic day. We have some colleagues from the German Embassy, the Goethe Institute, the Sovlenin Embassy, the Flanders, among many others. So there I remind you that tonight is the last night of the UK being part of the EU. And I will say that I'm glad to now invite Her Excellency Catherine Colonna, our ambassador, to address this very special moment of our history and to open the night of ideas and afterwards give the floor to Theodor Zeldin. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Claudine, for my kind of you. Distinguished guests, uh, I'm following the lead of trying to speak a broken English. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, chers amis, permettez-moi de, de vous dire quelques mots avant de déclarer ouverte la nuit des idées 2020. Just a few words before we open the night of it is 2020, a night of friendship, uniting French, British and European minds. I mean, that would be, it's not over, there would be other nights and other days. Um, friendship will go on, culture will go on, we shall go on. I'm only talking about this night of ideas, a night of friendship. Welcome to the Institut Francais. Thank you for being with us. It's quite a crowd and it's great. Tomorrow is an important day, I understand. But tonight is a very important day, a VID. It is the Night of Ideas 2020. And tonight, across the world, in 80 or 90 countries, you will tell me exactly, Claudine, how many there are, uh, which is quite an impressive number, 90 countries. And in the UK, in London, Edinburgh, Manchester, Bristol, Jersey, and Glasgow, hundreds and hundreds of meetings, of gatherings, of this one, are taking place. It's an important opportunity to talk, to exchange ideas, to debate, to disagree, maybe, or to agree, who knows. And this is of an immense value. This is of an immense value. It has always been, and in the context of repli sur soi, of inward looking, of cutting ties, it is even more important to talk to each other and to talk freely to each other. I mentioned freedom. Our two nations care for and respect freedom of speech. We had to practice it tonight, respectfully, friendly, and to foster dialogue, speak up. I should also mention freedom of movement, a great achievement of uh, the EU, one of the jewels of our crown. But I may talk to it, to, uh, about it uh, another day, uh, as tomorrow is another day. Tonight is the day of the Night of Ideas. Is your right, Claudine, the last night of the UK as a member of the European Union? Yesterday in the European Parliament, while um, 
approving the deal, we heard quotes of poets like George Eliot or Robert Burns. And tonight I can't help thinking of the words of the great Winston Churchill, a statesman, not a poet, about the need for a more united Europe. Tonight is the last night, so please take advantage of it, keep calm, stop texting, and talk to each other to make this night a very special night of ideas. Et maintenant, quelques remerciements comme il se doit. I'm happy and honored to welcome us a great Englishman, a great European, sir, and a world famous gentleman, Theodor Zeldin. It's a great honor to have you here, sir. Tonight we'll talk about the perception of nature. We're happy and proud to welcome Olivier Adam, Aline Penito, Joe Smith, Frédéric Aitwati, and many others to explore the changing shapes of our lives. We'll talk about technology, robotics, and AI. Many thanks as well to Joanna Bresson, Gaspar Koenig, Pascal Bruckner, Aldo Faisal, Beth Singler, and to all our distinguished speakers for their help in understanding where we are going. I'd be happy to learn. We'll talk about art and creation, about the boundaries between humanity and nature, between humans and machines, so writers, musicians, and artists can be our guides. We're grateful to Camille Aubry, Monica Sabolo, Riopi, Yinka Sonibare, Cyril de Comarque, and all the other artists who are joining us. The night is also turned towards the future, side by side, even though I don't really see the uh, crowd up there. Side by side with students and younger ones, younger generations, you will make the future, you will make our future. I'm happy to welcome you here, uh, all of you younger than I am. I would now like to thank King's College, Imperial College, La Maison Française d'Oxford, the York Festival of Ideas, the Goethe Institute and in HEC, who are major partners for this night. I would also like to express my warm thanks to our sponsors, without whom this event could not exist. The trust of the friends of the French Institute, cher Marc, merci d'être là, eminent trustees and members of the Patron Circle. I also need to thank the uh, CIC Banque Transatlantique, Eurostar and PwC. Then in my name, and in your name, I'm sure. Let me thank and congratulate the Institut Francais du Royaume-Uni, the Cultural Department and the Higher Education and Research Department of the French Embassy, l'Institut Francais d'Ecosse, les Alliances Françaises, and a few others. They did a fantastic job. And last but not least, my personal thanks to each one of you. You're the ones making this night a special night of ideas. Et maintenant, je déclare ouverte la Nuit des Idées 2020. I now declare the Night of Ideas 2020 open. Please welcome with me Mr. Theodor Zaldin, our guest of honor. Thank you. Well, I'm surprised to learn that I must speak in English. What a disaster. <laughs> Shows where the world is going. And I have nevertheless come here um, to talk about France, because France is not just a territory, it is an idea. And therefore, quite apart from the agreements with politicians may make, the ideas can flourish and can live in the air and then can do something useful. And the uh, hope that I have in coming here is that I am going to get you to help me. In other words, the awful thing about most events is that nothing happens afterwards. So how can we do something? Because we live in such um, difficult times, 
such mad times perhaps, that we need to discover new ways of thinking. And to me that means finding ways of thinking about remembering the past in a different way. Because we have seen the past hitherto as something which follows us and lives with us and dominates us. But in fact, we can do something with the past to extract from it what humans have tried to do and to realize that they have failed over and over again. But we can learn from their mistakes and we can therefore do something better and therefore find a new way of imagining the future based on past experience instead of ideology or utopia or whatever. And uh, I am uh, very grateful to the French from whom I have benefited enormously simply by being among them, simply by having studied them. They have encouraged me to think and to think in ways which are not, um, which are not usual. And I want to see whether you are interested by some exploration of the art of thinking. Um, I uh, think that you are all bilingual. Now this is something extraordinary because in this country, 68% of the population cannot speak a foreign language. Even those who have university or higher education, 48% only um, can still not speak a foreign language. What happens to you if you cannot speak a foreign language? Well, we have studies of bilingualism which shows that it does make a change to your brain. It enables you to think in a different way and enables you to think in different ways, in various different ways and uh, talking in French, even if one doesn't talk it perfectly, is a, an exercise in which one can be, develop the same joy which Federer finds in tennis. Um, so, now you understand why we are in the mess we are. How can you expect people who can have never spoken a foreign language to find any sympathy with Europe which speaks many different languages? How can you get the, how can you understand the, the, the insistence that this is the best country in the world when in the Nordic countries and in the Baltic countries, nine out of 10 people speak at least one foreign language and usually several. We are very backward in this. And uh, so the first thing we've got to do is what can we do about it? And uh, so I come here with a desire to say, au secours help us, we've got to do something, we're thinking, and uh, what should we do? Well, this is what I have tried to get into the heads of ambassadors ever since I've been meeting them, and they won't listen to me. So perhaps you will listen to me. Um, I think the French should be solving two problems, not only the problem of um, you might say, the inability to con converse with others, to put themselves into the shoes of other people, but also to um, treat something else which I'll come to. First of all, the French are great experts in the, the education of the very young, in infant schools, the maternelle. And I think they should come and colonize England with maternelles. <laughs> now this is um, a very financially workable po uh, proposition in the sense that nothing is more um, a burden to English parents, particularly parents who with the two jobs. Um, the cost of bringing up young children is enormous and it is impossible. And French schools can do something and can create a miracle because first of all, uh, when uh, infants can learn languages extremely easily, much better than the elders. And I would say that to make, the f to make this work well, the French should not simply teach French, they should teach several languages. 
And you know, if you get people to learn foreign languages when they're young, then they feel at home in other places and they become more skilled at, le at learning other languages. So, will you help me in that? Question one. Okay. And uh, in that way, you, uh, you are uh, uh, helping the British people, the parents, to deal with their children without this terrible sacrifice of a wife going out to work and giving all her salary to a minder. Um, well, the second question on which I, I put to you is that we're now in a very, s at the end of an era of history. For 300 years, we have believed in revolutions. We have had an agricultural revolution and an industrial revolution and a, uh, um, a revolution in our uh, population. We have had an explosion of, of, uh, of uh, uh, the number of people who lived here in Shakespeare's time, there were only three million people here. It must have been a very interesting place. And uh, we have uh, um, thought, as a result of all these great achievements, that we are always on the, on, the well, on, the, on the road to progress and to prosperity. And we've discovered that each of those wonderful um, skills that we have developed in the past 300 years are in fact bad for us. It, you know, it is like the end of Communist Party rule. Suddenly we discover it doesn't work. And we have discovered that it doesn't work to, to uh, farm in the way we have farmed. We've killed the soil. It doesn't work to have uh, industry which employs people in jobs they hate and uh, pollutes the cities and urbanization um, has brought everybody, so many people into the cities, so many uh, to such an extent um, that uh, quite soon we expect 75% of the world to be living in great cities. So look what's happened. We've got the, the empty land to look at and we've got to resuscitate it. We've got to reinvent a way of farming, reinvent a way of um, creating the objects which now at the moment dominate our lives in, into forcing us to buy things all the time because if we don't buy them, there'll be nothing for other people to do. So we've got to reinvent work. And so it is an exciting period to be. So instead of moaning about this uh, and getting angry about Brexit, which I was very angry, but I know, so it is a sim stimulus to us to deal with the really big problems and the, uh, the crisis of survival and the incomplete um, achievements of women and the um, frustrations of young people who've been defeated in elections more and more and who don't represent the, the policies which are now being implemented. So we've, we've got to do something about this. And uh, that makes one think, what can we do? And my answer is that let governments go on doing what they want. And in any case, without whether they're going to go on doing that, whatever we think. Um, but what can you do? <coughs> and I have devoted myself for some years now to encouraging people to develop a new kind of conversation. Um, the Madame the um, Ambassadrice has said we must converse, but what must we converse about? Um, and I have therefore invented a menu of conversation to make you talk about the things that are really important in your lives, as opposed to gossiping and doing all the amusing things that you do when you talk. And uh, in, fift in 15 countries, I have got people to reveal that when they are made to talk like this about subjects which matter to them, 
It is, they feel amazed. Why have we never talked about these things? Why is it so difficult to find time to talk? And I require them to talk for at least two hours. And they say, um, I can't talk for two hours with one person, it's impossible. No, one to one, and you form an understanding of another person. And so while other people devote themselves to introducing laws to get people to behave better and to work harder and to make more money, I think it is now in private life, which is what people care about more and more, which is their family and friends, which matter most to them. In private life, as I say, in personal relation, in relationships, building relationships, creating a family of, of friends from all countries is what is open to us now. And uh, I get enormous number of emails all the time from people all over the world. I got one this morning from Ghana. Will you, I am 20, 24 years old, I would like to organize conversations in Ghana. Um, I get letters from extraordinary places like Azerbaijan, for God's sake. What do I, what, why, are, why are they writing to me from there? Because it is a universal problem that people are isolated increasingly by their specialization. You go to university or you go to some training place and you are taught to become a narrow specialist in one thing and expected to go on doing that for the whole of your life. And you're isolated also by your education, which is different. You're isolated in where you live. Um, there are all sorts of things which limit people's lives now. And therefore, I would like your help in organizing more of these and bringing people together. I have succeeded even in bringing Turks and Armenians together. And they have liked it because I have stopped them talking about the same old things and talked about what everybody needs to do is what shall I do with my life? So this is my second proposal to you and I think it is a proposal which is relevant to the European Union's future. The great mistake which was made by the leaders of Europe was to think that all that required was uh, the homogenization of laws and regulations and so on. And they forgot that in order to have a, a political entity, an economic entity, people have got to love it. Now with nations, they didn't forget that. And they so invented all sorts of myths about how their country was wonderful and had been the best country in the world forever and how the king was wonderful and how we all agreed about our values and uh, but if I ask you now, you know, if you want, to, if you're foreign and you want to become British, you've got to um, pass an examination which you will say, do you believe in British values? What the hell are British values which are different from anybody else's values? Um, to be nice to everybody, to be fair play, that sort of thing. Well, you've got to play the game and say the right thing. Um, so I am... Uh, I uh, was pleased that this is not, not something which no one um, in, in government might approve of because I was interested to know that when I, when I met the president of France some years ago and we talked about all sorts of things, um, he got an idea of what I was doing. And when he went to the... Um, Congress, he made a speech in the Congress in the USA. He said, democracy is based on the daily conversations and uh, mutual understanding of people. Democracy is based on conversations. It hasn't been thought of before. And it's only by one-to-one -one that one can build people feeling that I am not your enemy. You may be different from me in many ways, but you're interesting, and I understand why you feel the way you do, and I know that you've been bashed up in all sorts of ways, and I understand your anger and so on. And we can only do it one by one. We cannot do it by laws. So will you help me with that? And the third question I want to put to you is the Brexit 
was voted in the referendum, you know, 52, 48, but if you look at it more carefully, it was won by only one third of the electorate. We're ruled by a minor minority. And the people who lost most of, have lost mo most of all, are of course the young. And the young are interested in going and traveling abroad and uh, not being stopped by policemen just because they've got the wrong passport and so on. And uh, what are we going to do about the young? And all the old people who have kept, who have engineered this break with Europe, they are dying fast. Every year, half a million of them die. In fact, between, 19, between 2016 and, and now, you know, about two million have gone. In other words, if we had the referendum now, it might have been different, except for the obstinacy of people who, having voted leave, feel it is an insult to them that the politicians don't obey them. What are politicians for? Are they there simply to do what people who don't know what's, what uh, leaving the union means tell them to do? Or are they there to pr bring wisdom and to, to be each of them capable of standing independently of whatever their party says. And uh, uh, so I want you to think about what we can do about the future of young people. And we, unless we do something, they are going to feel more and more dissatisfied with the kind of jobs we invented for them in the last few centuries, which is to have a career in a specialized job and to um, sit in front of a computer and uh, to uh, be a manager. The best thing that can happen to you is to become a manager and no longer to use your speciality, but to push people around and uh, um, annoy everyone else. Um, the uh, jobs we have invented can be reinvented. And we've got to invent jobs because ultimately, Work is where you spend most of your life. And, uh, you know, most of the days of your life with the hope that you can get away at the end of it, but except at the end of it you are uh, so exhausted there's nothing much you can do. It is very important that a French um, court recently declared the habits of the, the methods of businesses in making work more stressful and demanding people should work harder and harder for longer and longer hours was against the rights of human rights. It's the first time this has happened. And if it is against human rights, well, it's time we did something about it. But of course, nothing will be doubted, be, be done about it unless we do it. Therefore, I appeal to you, all of you, who must be involved in jobs of different kinds. I presume you're not all lazy people who've got nothing to do in the afternoon. Um, what can your, your particular activity do to participate in experimental work? I'm not saying we should change, ask people to change. I am saying only that every business, every institution should have a research and development part which like the pharmaceuticals, tries out different remedies for our problems and gets young people to try them out and let us see whether, whether it works. Of course, it will not work very well many times, but sometimes it might. You know, electric light took about 10,000 attempts before it was invented, but this is something we can do. And so this is what wild governments argue about you know, whether there are going to be more jobs for customs officers to stand at Dover and stop people getting into England. Um, what can every ordinary people do? Um, and so I uh, um, conclude that the, what I'm saying to you is it's in interpersonal relations that we can start things going. We don't convince people, we convince one person. We, share ideas with one person. I believe in the couple as being the new force. 
not just the collective, not just the lonely individual, but the couple. And I, by couple, I don't mean just a person, two people who live together. I mean people who sympathize with each other, who get to know each other. I mean friends, people one understands, and one can have many different couples, couples of the mind. Well, they were. I've told you what I think, and I hope this um, event of the night of ideas enables you in the morning to think that you're going to do something useful in the daytime as well as at night. And uh, so good luck to you. Thank you for inviting me. I expected to speak in French, but perhaps you would not have understood my French. So perhaps you have not understood my English either. <laughs> well, thank you all the same. Okay. Right, so good evening everyone and a, a massive thank you to Her Excellency the Ambassador and uh, uh, Theodor Zeldin for a really great introduction of the Night of Ideas. And for me, what really stands out is this art of thinking and what we're going to be doing tonight. So as a way of introduction, my name is Mark Benner. Um, that's my third year. Some of you might have seen here, me here a couple of years uh, now. And I'm really, really happy to be once again helping Claudine and her team who've done a fabulous time, fabulous job in getting everybody uh, in this place for amazing panels. So as a way of introduction, I, I, you know, if I look at those two flags, I've been in the UK for 20 years. I'm French, my wife is British, my two kids are French and English or British, and they both went to maternelle and one ended up going to an English system, the other one to a French system. So this for me is what Europe and the UK and continuing to working together and, and really living together is important. So we talk about what does it mean to be alive? And if you think about it, there's two things. On the one hand, some people might think that the world is collapsing. We're at the brink of the end of the world. Uh, climate change, just look at the virus spreading out of space. And, you know, we talked about um, urbanization, the speed at which viruses are spreading. That's the doom and gloom. On the other hand, some people say technology is probably going to save us. We will find solutions. We will find ways. And we are creating the humans of tomorrow. So the next few hours will be about exploring those two areas, thinking about how do we think about the future, how do we think about our next future and humanity. So you'll be hopefully moving around in the different rooms uh, and we'll talk about the different events and hopefully you've looked at the different uh, subjects. I think all of the rooms are already full for, for this next event. You know, there is not a huge amount of movement going forward. I hope you're going to be going from one room to the other. Uh, we are being broadcasted live on YouTube and this is technology and so some people might be watching at home, so we'll say hello to all of them. And this is about you interacting and engaging. There will be times for Q&As. Uh, some people will be texting, other might be on Twitter, on Facebook. Just you know, bring your ideas and share it with people out there. Uh, and you'll see that you know, the night will evolve in all sorts of different ways. So without further ado, I think we're going to start in this room um, with really thinking about the language of Wales, and we've got some great experts. We're getting the room ready. Um, I know for my point of view, I went to Hermanus in, uh, in South Africa about 20 years ago, and I don't know if anybody of you have been, but you've got tens of Wales coming together in that bay, and that was 20 years ago, and I remember it as it was yesterday, and, and Wales have something magic to all of us. I've tried to go and see them on the Isle of Man because I think you can see them not so far away. I haven't seen them yet, but maybe you can tell us you know, how we go and see them. So um, I'd like to invite a few people on stage. First, I'd like to ask Camille Aubry, who's a, um, she's working with the Watershed's Pervasive Media Studio in Bristol. Uh, and she will be capturing some of the key moments and topics during the, uh, the event. So, She'll be sat over there quietly taking um, a lot of drawing and taking 
the essence of what our panelists are saying. I'm going to ask uh, our lead, Tia um, Simila, to stage. So Tia is a researcher, writer, and specialist in Wales, and she holds a PhD on the behavioral ecology of kill killer whales uh, from the University of Tromsø, and she'll be leading the panel. And I'd like to invite the three panelists, Olivier Adam, Aline Penito, and Philippe Hall on stage. Thank you very much. Is this it? Yeah. Good evening. Uh, welcome all to this event uh, called In the Company of Wales. Um, my name is Tiu Similar, and I have uh, studied whales in uh, Arctic Norway since 1987, and <coughs> mainly killer whales, but also sperm whales in the recent years. And I'm delighted to introduce you to our uh, <laughs> presenters this evening. Who are Olivier? Yes, and Hi. who is a yeah, professor in the uh, University of Sorbonne, specialist in uh, acoustics and whales. There's Philip Hoare, who is a professor in uh, creative writing, who has done some really interesting things with the uh, whales and um, passion about uh, broadcasting ideas about whales. And there is a uh, <laughs> Aline Panito, who is a composer, sailor, and a radio documentarist with some really cool work on, on whales and uh, music and communication. And since we are maybe a little bit short of time, I will shorten my time here talking, but I would somehow like to present to you uh, this basic idea, why are whales so inspiring? Why are we inspired by whales? Yeah. And maybe globally speaking, it all started with a famous novel by Herman Melville, published in 1850, 1851, which kind of still is capturing our image or, or our um, idea about the whale. And in the recent decades, our idea about the whale has changed a lot because there has been what you might call adventurers and, and scientists looking more deeply into the into the lives of whales, understanding their social structure, their acoustics and vocal communication. But also in, in, at the same time, there have been people like you guys there, writers, composers, artists, who have tried very new different ways in how we could maybe communicate and interact with whales. And uh, yes, so I think we start by you, Philip, telling about your work. Okay. Um, I, how do you speak about whales? There aren't any words for whales. What did you say when you saw your first whale? <laughs> what? 
I know what I saw when I saw my first whale. I was in Cape Cod mm. uh, uh, on the prow of a whale watch boat, and I had bad memories of whales because my first whale was a captive whale in Windsor Safari Park. It's now Legoland outside London. And I remember being fascinated with whales as a boy, myself and my sisters, and the way you're fascinated with dinosaurs, these amazing animals, and dolphins. And I was interested because of Jacques Cousteau. He's the person who introduced us to the underwater world. And so we pestered our parents to take us to Windsor Safari Park where we knew there were dolphins. And we sat at the front of the row, right in front of the seat like you are now. And a big black gate opened up at one end of this overgrown swimming pool. And in swam the dolphins, jumping with joy, hydrodynamic, exquisite creatures, created out of a kind of architecture of evolution. And then someone held up a hoop. The dolphin jumped through it, threw a ball in the air, and the dolphin spanned the ball on its beak. And then the dolphin got a reward, a fish, for its trouble. And then the pool was cleared, and a bigger, blacker gate opened up at the other end of the pool. And in swam Ramu, our other performer, an orca, a killer whale. The most successful mammal on this planet, not human beings, the oldest evolved mammal in many ways. Six million years they've been around in their current evolved state. They have a matrilineal, matriarchal culture which reaches back that far. This animal was in an overgrown swimming pool. So when held up a hoop, Orca, Ramu the orca, jumped through the hoop. They threw a ball in the air, and Ramu balanced the ball on his nose. And Ramu got his reward, a fish. For me, that moment was a moment of apostasy. I had to stop loving these animals because I realized what we did to them. But it wasn't like the undersea water of Jacques Cousteau at all. It was an animal stolen from the wild and put into this container. And so flash forward to the year 2000, I'm in Cape Cod, and I see whale watching advertised. We just have been talking about whale watching, which is a big problem. It's a big joy, but it's a big problem. But I didn't really know anything about that. I was in Boston, in Cape Cod, in the year 2000. I've been visiting a friend of mine. I didn't realize you could go Cape whale watching there. I saw a big placard on the quayside saying, whale watching, $12. And I thought, oh, is it just another circus act? another performance, another mediation of these animals. Nonetheless, I had time before I was going back to get my flight back from Logan Airport. I got on this boat, stood on the prow of the boat with my arms folded saying, show me what you've got. And about half an hour later, out in the middle of Stellwagen Bank, a marine reserve, a 40-ton, 40 40-foot 40 humpback whale breached right in front of me. I was a practiced writer I had a word for that, it was fuck. <laughs> because there are no words to, to shut that distance. You, there's no way we can bridge the whale's world and ours. We, we have made the whale change according to what we want it to be. It was the whale of creation of the Quran. It was the whale of creation myth. It's the whale of the Mari or of the Haida a majestic animal which a founding myth of their, of their creation, then it became, because we needed it to be, an industrial resource. We boiled it down for its oil. Then we decided, because a pair of scientists went off the island of Bermuda and lowered a hydrophone into the ocean and recorded this sound, the first time we heard sound of culture from another species, the song of the humpback whale. We will be hearing about that later. That's the moment that everything changed again. Because we realized an animal which had been regarded as dumb and unable to protest its abuse not only had a voice, but a poetry, a culture, a lamentation, a threnody, a reproach. It's actually the song of sex. But to what it sounds like to us was the sound that saved the whale. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. So, Aline, thank you, Philip.
wonderful. So I don't know if we hear something from the computer. Maybe. Hello. OK. <laughs> That's us in the, in the article. So I've spent four months in the Arctic. Okay. I'm a composer, author, and radio documentary, and ISIS navigator. I was a part of the team on a sailing boat that crossed the Northwest Passage four months in the height of the magnetic North Pole. On every sailing trip I've made, whales, both large male dolphins, have approached the boat, sometimes alone during very special moments, sometimes hundreds of them in a school. Like old sailor, I mean like you, for example. I have a very precise memory of each encounter. Once, Look. we were stuck in the ice north of Alaska, near Barrow, the northernmost village on the American continent. continent. Ice flows, blocks of frozen seas, everywhere as far as the eye could see. All of the ice traps the sailor in the kind of mirage from which it's difficult to escape. First of all, a breeze. I don't know, I don't remember um, if our first perception was the sights, the sound, or the horrible smell of this breeze. And then the back of a very large whale back and forth and about one cable from the boat. There was a copy of Moby Dick on board and it, I came to this passage. Ince, by inference, I think you know that. Ince, by inference, it had been believed by some whale men that the Norway's passage so long a problem to men was never a problem for the whale. Moby Dick, the book, sorry, is a monument of literature without a doubt. Melville prose is sublime. Like all monuments, it had found a profound influence on our representation, reference, thoughts, ideas. And this text is centrous on an adolescent or neurotic proof of something to the hand for the killing of the whale. This is some ice, and we can hear, we can hear some ice in the south of Greenland. I want a sorry, uh, sorry, of four long radio documentaries about whales and about a new generation of researchers as Olivier for Radio France, France Culture, ethologist, medievist, ethnologist, biologist, bioacoustician. One documentary is particular, in particular is situated at the crossroads of art, science, and the environment. I will talk about that later on. I call this series Forgetting Moby Dick. I hope, on my humble way, to initiate a, number, a new way of thinking and living with marine spaces. I believe that we are able to think beyond the figure of the Leviathan, or maybe you know this, this thing. Lately, we, the humans, have learned that whales possess memory and social structures. We humans are a part of the memory that transmits it from whale to whale through their own form of representation. Maybe it's time, the time is thus ripe to inaugurate acts of interspecies, interspecies reconciliation. And in this, we humans have our work cut out for us. 
art science project that I will describe later is based on this idea. Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not a biologist. I'm an uh, engineer in acoustics. And uh, when I started to uh, work on uh, waves, I, wa I was very interested about their sound, their sound. And um, they are mammals, okay? So they have, uh, we have something like uh, 90 species, different species. Uh, they are very different from each other. You have baleen whales and uh, tooth whales. And uh, they are very different in anatomy, in uh, their behaviors, uh, in habitats, and also about sounds, okay? And uh, it's very interesting because if you put a microphone under the water, uh, you can hear a lot of different sounds. And um, uh, obviously not only about whales, uh, a lot of uh, animals uh, emit sounds in the water, fish, uh, shrimps, uh, and also uh, all the human activities we can hear, so it's uh, pretty dense. And, um, but we, with the sound, we can do a lot. We can know the whales are, are present because uh, obviously uh, they have to breathe at the sea surface, but sometimes they are very discreet and very uh, uh, shy, so they run away from the boat and so on. So with acoustic, we can uh, hear them because they are very uh, vocal acti uh, active uh, vocals, so uh, they emit a lot of different sounds, so we can uh, record it at distance. We can try to localize them, we can try to identify them, uh, so we, can, we have a lot of different things, and of, uh, obviously we can also um, have information about their behavior and what they are doing and what about their interactions. And so the story starts in 1971, so uh, it's, not, uh, it's not from yesterday, huh? and, but uh, with uh, a, a paper uh, in, uh, published by two uh, American researchers, uh, Roger Penn and Scott McVeigh, they published in uh, the famous uh, scientific uh, uh, review uh, Science. And in this, pa this paper was amazing for two reasons. First one, of course, we have no idea at this time that they have sounds in the water, okay, uh, underwater in the ocean. And then, uh, they say, okay, they have, uh, we have the sounds, but also we have singers in the water. So it was something like amazing. And the second reason is because uh, bioacoustic at this time, it was for uh, birds and from uh, some few uh, terrestrial uh, species, but nothing about, uh, about the ocean. And uh, so what they said, they, they, try, so they listen, they listen the, the sounds emitted by humpback whales, and uh, they start to think that maybe all the vocalizations uh, are organized in time, and uh, the whales repeat uh, these uh, different uh, phrases a uh, few times, and uh, so uh, this is the definition of song, okay? If I said, uh, hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? I'm starting to sing, okay? Because I'm repeating the same things, okay? You can just listen. Every music in the world is the same. Uh, so, um, so, voilà. and so they publish this. So obviously, I, I, uh, I met uh, Scott McVeigh uh, uh, something like three years ago or four years ago. And uh, he said something very interesting. He said when uh, they send the paper to uh, science, uh, they were sure that it will, be, it will be published because, of course, it's amazing uh, uh, new things and uh, knowledge about uh, what happened in the ocean. And uh, so the director of science said, OK, uh, we, you will be published. And uh, Scott McVeigh and uh, uh, Roger Penn said, OK, but we want to do the cover of uh, your magazine. And so it's maybe uh, exaggerated because they were uh, very young and it was their first uh, paper and said, no, maybe, uh, you know, we are a book review, don't, we don't want to uh, do the cover. And so they refuse to publish uh, their uh, paper in science. And 10 months after, the editor said, OK, you will do the, uh, you, you, you will do the, the cover. So um, it's, uh, it's amazing. OK, so the, the Wells... Uh, uh, um, it made different uh, vocalizations, and what we did from uh, 71 to uh, 2020 is to try to understand what, uh, what is the motivation of these sounds, how they generate them. Uh, uh, we, sp we speak now about uh, cultural transmission, because uh, it's an interaction between uh, different singers, so they, uh, they um, exchange uh, different uh, sound units, sound units is vocalization, so they exchange uh, some vocalizations, and I will uh, tell you all of uh, this in after. But just, think, uh, just one uh, last word, uh, I have an idea uh, 
uh, about what we can do together uh, after Brexit uh, is to uh, watch nature. Okay, go back and go see uh, nature. Uh, go with your cell phone. Uh, take pictures of everything. Uh, record, uh, record the sounds of the nature, and uh, you will be amazed. Nous sommes la mer. Please send us near. Somebody said, Ma, we are the sea. The sea connects us. The whale is the visible spirit of the sea. It leaves its environment, an environment in which we are still useless. I swim in the sea every day. I swim in the sea this morning at three o'clock, in the dark, in the cold, in the wet. I didn't learn to swim until I was 30 years old. The sea is the thing that saves us. The sea is the thing that's rising against us. The sea is the barometer of all that threatens us in many ways. And the sea is the thing that gives us air. And the reason why the whale is so important is because it comes as an emissary. We have an ambassador in front of us. Whales are ambassadors to us. They are, they are carriers of that culture and of a story which is unknown to us. And what we do through science or art is far more important than Britain leaving the EU. And what we do in the ocean is far more important than a lot of the politics we talk about. And the reason why we are sitting in this room and we, why we find whale interesting, which is, speaks very directly to what you just said, Olivier, is because the whale gives us a kind of hope. Jacques Cousteau said, while there's still the sea, we have hope. And until we understand those things, just like that amazing presentation we just had, until we understand these things, we're not going to sort out our lives because things are going badly wrong in many ways. And I think the whale is, is, is something that can... Is, it's, 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 the, it's the symbol. After all, the environmental movement was born out of what Roger Payne and Scott McVeigh did by recording that sound. That was what alerted to us, to the entire environment. The whale became the canary, and it still is. But you and I, and we know, we haven't saved the whale. You know, the great campaign of Save the Whale, of Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, we haven't saved the whale. The whale might yet perish because of what we do. So, in a way, we compartmentalize. You're talking as an engineer. You're talking as a researcher. You're talking as a, a musician. I'm talking as a writer. You know, the trouble is that we separate ourselves, and we can, you know, this is why this, a night of big ideas is such a fantastic idea. I think the whales would agree. <laughs> Uh, they have ideas, huh? so uh, they probably uh, organize the same event uh, as tonight uh, for themselves. Huh? <laughs> um, me or, or Olivier? I don't know. Okay. Mm. Maybe Olivier, because you are going to speak okay, about that. Okay, know. so um, um, they, they use, in, in fact, in the ocean, the light, it's, uh, you, can't, you can't see very far, okay? Uh, when it's a very, very uh, uh, nice water, you can see maybe at uh, 30 meters, so it's not, uh, it's not uh, very useful. For cetacean species, they are very uh, haptic uh, uh, animals, and uh, they want to keep a visual connection. But obviously, uh, if they go uh, a little far away, they lost uh, the vis uh, visual connection, and so they use sound. So they use sound for everything. Okay, uh, every their uh, every their um, vital activities, uh, they and and uh, uh, to well use sound for echolocalization. So echolocation, echolocation is to send a sound and to have a, 
to use the eECO to know uh, about your environment, about uh, where are the prey and so on. So they use uh, uh, sound is very important. And so that's the reason why, uh, for example, uh, uh, noise pollution uh, underwater it's a big issue for uh, cetacean species is because uh, uh, acoustics um, from the boats, uh, acoustics from uh, different uh, human activities uh, mask uh, their uh, their sounds, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's much more difficult. I invite you if you want to watch the movie. Sonic Sea, for example, it's a very uh, nice documentary about uh, noise pollution, uh, underwater noise pollution. Okay, so they used uh, they used the sound. Okay, this is the cover I spoke uh, I spoke uh, just a few minutes ago. And uh, okay, the idea is to write uh, phrases. Okay, so each line it's a phrase, and um, it's a different. Uh, the little uh, uh, pictogram uh, pictograms are vocalization. So maybe we can uh, hear. Uh, 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 it's a it's a recording from Madagascar. I'm not sure if you, you can hear maybe the action of Madagascar. It's one, one hour long, so we have time. The, 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 song, the song is um, it's made with different vocalizations. And so for this uh, example, we have something like five uh, vocalizations. And after, the well, the well repeats the song again and again and again, from this way again and again. After they change the frame, they do again. And uh, the, whole, the duration of the song is about 15 minutes. So if the whale stay uh, in this area for two hours or three hours, the, the, the whale will repeat and sing the song. And uh, like us, for example, when we have uh, music in our head uh, from the morning to the end of the day. Okay, thank you. Um, so the, okay, so wh what we can do with that, we can uh, use uh, this uh, vocalization to try to uh, understand what they're doing exactly. And uh, so they, uh, okay, one thing it's, we think that it's only from males, okay? So singers are only males, and um, and they are very active, uh, very acoustically active uh, during the breeding season. So the first idea from the biologist uh, was, okay, it's probably uh, something to attract female and uh, females, okay? It was a good idea. So Peter Tayak, who is a main uh, res American researcher, uh, tried to uh, do playback uh, in 1986. So what he did, he, he put a play, uh, a speakers in the water and play uh, a male song uh, to uh, different females around and no one came to the boat and uh, <laughs> no, as they, as they tried to escape. And uh, we di I did that in Madagascar because I like to play too and, uh, and it was uh, exactly the same. Okay? Some of uh, females uh, go away from the boat. Um, but, um, it's, uh, so it was not exactly working. But playback is very difficult because if you want to, to, uh, to play a, a song for, uh, for example, uh, uh, Johnny Hallyday or Etienne Dao, it's not the same result, of course. So we have to be careful about what we can do uh, under the water. But the thing is um, uh, Phil Clapham, who is a main American researcher working on Humpback Wells, uh, published a paper in the 90s. He said uh, because uh, the males, the males uh, whales are very, very, uh, focused on something during the breeding season, the female can um, try to uh, hide and uh, discreetly uh, leave the place. Okay, so it's about uh, harassment. Uh, voilà. So uh, after we switch, uh, and uh, Australian researcher uh, called um, uh, Noad, um, he, he published a paper in uh, 2000, uh, 2002 or something like this, and uh, he said so. It's probably the song is probably uh, the interaction between uh, males, uh, because uh, the, the sound, in fact, uh, have a lot of different information from the singer. Uh, you know, like my voice, for example. You can know uh, if I'm male or female. You can know about uh, my age because I have not the same voice when I was two years old and when I will be uh, 70. Uh, so, and uh, you can know if uh, I'm uh, in a good health or not and so on. So can, and, um, and you can localize me. Okay, so it's very important because uh, the competition between males in this area is uh, huge uh, and the, the, song can, the song can be uh, one of the methods to uh, uh, tell the other males I'm here and I want to uh, stay in place. Okay. 
And then, um, so we, what we did uh, in Madagascar, we play uh, with the speakers uh, sounds from female, okay? Because all the cetacean species emit, uh, emit sound, uh, female and uh, calf and so on, okay? So we play, but they don't sing because they don't repeat uh, complex uh, vocalization during the time, okay? So we play um, uh, sounds emitted by female to different males around the boat. Uh, but it's not, he, he was not working. Well, okay, we don't know why, but okay, we tried to go uh, further in this. Okay, and so, oh, just uh, the, um, the slide before, uh, I, um, in 2013, I started to work with uh, anatomists, uh, Jerry Redenberg in New York City, uh, because they had my first uh, questions about uh, how, uh, about all this song is to, uh, I ask uh, <coughs> experts, uh, how the baleen whales, uh, whales uh, emit sounds, okay, how they generate sounds. And in 2000, and before 2007, we have no idea about that, okay? And uh, between 2007 and 2012, it was not exactly clear. And so we, were, we focused on the um, respiratory system because we tried to find something in the respiratory sy system and the, um, the vibrator, in fact, uh, to explain how they can produce the vocalization. And uh, it was very interesting because uh, all the baleen whales have a total different respiratory system uh, from all the other uh, mammal species, okay? Uh, like tooth whales, but also uh, terrestrial uh, mammals, okay? And, uh, and uh, bats too, okay? And this uh, respiratory system is from the lungs. They have a trachea, uh, they have cava casal, um, uh, nasal cavities. Uh, the mouth is totally disconnected from the respiratory system, so they, can, they can't breathe uh, from the mouth and they can't uh, eat from their nose. You can uh, drink with your nose if you want because it's connected, but not for the whales. And, uh, but so they have a balloon, they have a balloon connected to the trachea, okay, and so they can, s um, they can uh, send the air from the lungs to this balloon, okay, so that's good. And they can, after that, uh, compress the balloon and uh, put the air, go back to the lungs. And the idea is to uh, make, the, make the apnea uh, longer, okay? You can do it in your bathroom if you want. Uh, you go in the apnea, okay, you put some air in the balloon before, you go in apnea, okay, after one minute, uh, you're totally, uh, it's, it's the end, so you... <laughs> you take the air from the balloon, okay? And so you do uh, two minutes, okay? So it's the, same, it's the same thing for whales. But what we notice, we notice that the, the connection of this balloon to the trachea is made with two cartilages, and these cartilages have a membrane on it, and this membrane starts to vibrate when the, the air is going from the lungs to this uh, balloon, okay? And this is uh, the vibrator we create, we generate the, um, the vocalization, okay? And then, Next picture, see si please. And next, we even explain how a whale can bridge. Okay, you speak about bridge. A bridge, it's a uh, aerial jump. Okay, that is 30 tons, huh? 30 tons, 40 maybe. So it's very difficult to do, huh? to extract uh, all body from the surface. Uh, I was always amazed to see that in 2007 when I start working on whales and see a whale jumping on the water. It's not exactly a dolphin. You see, a dolphin can uh, jump e very easily. They, p they uh, are very active, uh, very tonic on their uh, fluke. And at one point, uh, they have enough uh, speed to jump uh, outside of the water, but the whales never do that because it's a very huge, gigantesque uh, animal, so forget it, okay? We never saw a whale uh, use their fluke like crazy to uh, have a specific uh, speed and uh, do a jump, okay? So we explain, we are the first in the world to explain how uh, uh, whale jump, and in 2020, at the end of the, day of the year, because uh, I'm very late on all my different uh, ideas, so I will say uh, December 2023, we, 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 we are writing right now a paper about how they swim. Okay, just uh, one last word. <laughs> I can tell you why how they swim. Huh? This is very interesting about it. Okay, it's about their respiratory system, okay? So it's uh, very important to do some anatomy and to get some information from all the whales, okay? But to, just to say something about South Africa. Of course, these whales are known about their song, but they're also known about their migration routes, okay? So they go, they go from their uh, feeding uh, areas, so cold waters, to uh, breeding areas, uh, warm waters. And in South Africa, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, one place they can uh, eat, so uh, like uh, 
uh, little fish or uh, small fish or uh, cre creels and so on. And uh, it's the reason why we can see a lot of different uh, whales at this time because they are all go in the same restaurant uh, together. Uh, we can see these whales in saint pierre et it's a French, uh, French, um, French uh, islands in North Canada. And uh, we can see groups of uh, 20 uh, whales, uh, 50 whales, uh, 60 whales. So it's very, uh, it's, it's, it's very nice to see. Okay, and uh, two years ago, um, uh, South African researcher uh, Ken Finlay uh, wrote a paper in Marine Mammal Science because he he saw uh, 200 humpback whales in the same day. Uh, in uh, South Afri uh, Africa, and he was something like crazy. And he, 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 work, he worked on whales for 30 years, okay? And it was the first time he saw uh, as many whales in this area. And uh, he wrote a, a paper uh, called the Supergroup, okay? So maybe Supergroup, it's all over the world, but it was the first uh, uh, paper who uh, was uh, documented with uh, uh, footages, uh, video footages, because now we use drones for everything, so that's good, okay? And, uh, but the, the short letter, uh, you have no idea why uh, this day it was, uh, no, I tell you the, the story and the full story, huh? okay. Uh, they have, uh, you have no idea why all these whales uh, are present in this area at this time. Uh, he said, okay, usually it's about 50 whales, but uh, you know, no, no more, and this, this day was crazy. And uh, he, he did nothing else because he have no time, he shoot, uh, he, he take pictures of all the different whales, it went and so on, so he did nothing about it. So he didn't uh, measure the temperature of the water, he didn't see if they have uh, food a lot uh, in it, fine, okay. So at the end of this paper, he said, no, no, uh, I don't want to, do, to make an assumption because we are scientists and all, all, all the time we want to explain, to try to explain everything. So he said, no, no, I have no idea what happened, it's just a visual observation and this is it. And we have a journalist, okay, a journalist in South Africa who wrote a journalist uh, in a general paper like uh, Elle or uh, Figaro, I don't know, and he wrote, okay, this day, these uh, 200 whales were present uh, in uh, this uh, dance pack uh, because they, uh, they think about a conspiracy against humanity. Okay, <laughs> so this is the only uh, reason, <laughs> the only explanation we have uh, right now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Just uh, uh, only one word. Uh, I, I spoke about uh, ideas. No, no, just very fast about uh, about ideas uh, for whales. Uh, we um, uh, they interact. They interact with sound. Okay, so they exchange. We speak about language. We speak. We speak about uh, culture. They exchange sound. We have uh, regional dialect. We have group dialect. Okay, so uh, we know that the sound is um, uh, means something for them. Okay, it's not uh, something like free and they are happy a bit, uh, about it. Okay. And And uh, they create, uh, they have idea because, uh, for example, uh, you can find a lot of things on, uh, on YouTube if you want uh, about a technique of uh, to feed. Okay, they create a new technique of feed. And in Boston, for example, uh, in Cape Cod, uh, humpback whales uh, introduce a new technique to uh, to um, uh, eat the little fish in this area called lobtail uh, hunting. Uh, it was published by uh, Jenny Allen. So uh, these uh, humpbacks uh, just uh, Notice that uh, when the fish are a little stressed, uh, they are going together, very compact, and so after that they go, open the mouth, and uh, take uh, all the, the fish. So they just um, uh, they just uh, uh, do some sounds with the fluke. Okay, the fluke. They, uh, how you say that? You flu uh, the tail. Okay, they, uh, okay, and voilà. Et, uh, the fish. Uh, voilà. It's a new technique. Voilà. Thank you very much. So I, was, I work with electroacoustic music in this field. Composers work with technical aspects of sound, bending and recording it, creating composition from the material of recorded song. Uh, I met Olivier six years ago, and he sent me a CD with a ton of whales. Uh, that he and his colleagues had recorded, and for me, it was as if uh, time had stopped. The art science perspective um, suggests in striking similarity between Ampak Well and the bassoon. This discovery blew me away. After listening to Ampak Well's song, the first bassoonist I recorded with 
Wiz asked me, but why do this whale play the bassoon? So we just uh, we heard some whale. So that's unity, S sound unit. <laughs> What is it? Again, another one. <coughs> Bassoon or whale? Bassoon. Why? Cool. <laughs> Bassoon or whale? <laughs> Easy. Cool. Okay, very soon. So two years ago, I go in Reunion Island. My parents are living there. And I played uh, this uh, bassoon or transformed sound into the ocean uh, several times. And um, this is what happened. We can hear... Um, I have a speaker in, the, in a part of the, the boat, and in the other part, I have uh, hydrophones. Uh, Olivier was not there, so I record one of the response. After that, I ask Olivier, the bassoonist, and a friend of mine uh, to speak about what they, they can hear. Bassoon. Est-ce que ça, ce serait pas le bassoon? The bassoonist. <laughs> My friend. Ça, c'est la baleine. Mais par contre, c'est étonnant quand même. Oui, on dirait un barisson d'éléphant, mais c'est... Ça ressemble énormément. Ça pourrait complètement être une, euh, une vocaliste de, de baleine à bosse très proche en fait de l'hydrophone. Ça c'est excellent. Le la baleine. Ça c'est la baleine. La réponse et donc là il y a des sons de basson dedans. She can't say. C'est une baleine qui parle. On est d'accord que là, c'est la baleine qui écoute le son du basson Moi qui ai une interaction, ça ne m'étonne pas, mais c'est vrai qu'avec le basson, on s'est quand même piégé. I don't remember myself. So. Est-ce que ça c'est une baleine à bosse qui répond ça? Tu sais? Elle va s'en souvenir parce que quand elle va revenir l'année prochaine, mais après elle va savoir qu'elle a fait en donner une interaction avec vous. C'est une baleine ça. C'est beau. Mais pardon. Aucune idée. Sincèrement, je je sais plus d'où vient le son. Si c'est du, si c'est des sons de c'est des vocalistes de baleines euh, et ou si c'est ou si c'est des préenregistrements. Ce qui est intéressant, c'est que nous, par exemple, quand on fait des expérimentations, so we are completely unable to to say if it's bassoon or well or if when we are playing together. After I don't know, maybe 10, 20 minutes. They began to um, to play with a special song. You don't speak about that. That pulsed sound. It's kind of a something like that. And they proposed me to play only pulsed sounds. That's beautiful. That's a bassoon. Pulsed. J'en avais pas entendu 
Pulsat Sounds. C'est vraiment étonnant. Well, we were crying uh, on the sailboat because it's very, very mo moving. And to thank the, the whale, I decided to play a very ancient song, a female song, which is very, very beautiful. And this is what happened. Um, I wonder, when we listen to the whale, what we're hearing, and if you've been in the water with those animals when they make those noises, you feel them, you don't hear them, you feel them. The first time I was in the water with a, a sperm whale, there was a, a large group of maybe a dozen sperm whales ahead of me, and I was swimming towards them, and the, the largest animals, the animals came swimming towards me, and um, I felt I didn't hear the sound as she was echolocating my body <coughs> through my skull, <coughs> through my sternum, <coughs> through the whole of my skeletal structure, <coughs> sectioning me in three dimensions in sound. I'd spent 20 years trying to describe whales and here was a whale trying to describe me. And I felt that, I felt that. It was like being in an MRI scanner. I've been in an MRI scanner as well. And it's a physicality which we, we have no comprehension because we don't live in that world. They live, they must live in a world of sound because they live in the dark. Because I, eyesight is not much good to you two miles down when you're searching for squid. You know, so they're echolocated for squid, but they're communicating. So especially, uh, it's a very different with the toothed whales, as Olivia said, the, you know, the toothed whales, which are the orca, the sperm whales, the beaked whales, uh, the dolphins. And they have a highly, hi much more uh, accurate sonic generation than the baleen whales and the humpback whales we're talking about. They can tell if a woman's pregnant before she knows she's pregnant. They have a comprehension not only of the world around them, but of each other. So they can tell 
what temperature another animal is, a sperm whale, or an orca, a dolphin. So I can tell if you're angry or sexy or feeling sick because I can scan you. I can feel that through. It's like x-ray. It's like almost telepathy. How does that change you, the way you relate as a mammal? And remember, these are the most developed mammals on Earth after us and maybe primates, but that jury's out there. Sperm whales have the biggest brain on the planet. How Whitehead, a great friend of ours, we know you certainly too, is one of the greatest sperm uh, scientists working now, I would say, but certainly the most uh, expert on sperm whales. He talks about sperm whales as having the ability to use tools for complex communication, but also a sense of their abstract selves. So they actually think about themselves as individuals. To the extent that how Whitehead wonders if they actually wonder about their existential self. He even posits the notion that they might have developed their own ideas of religion to try and comprehend why they are on this planet and what they are doing. So how does that change? In a hundred years' time, who will be sitting in this auditorium? and What will they be saying about these animals that we are so... We're flailing about, we, we're grasping at sounds, at statistics, at experience. Ultimately, with the whale, they are unknown. I know him not and I never will, is what Melville wrote after writing 136 chapters on the whale. He decided he knew him not. So I just wonder what the future will say about what we're saying about whales now. We are kind of running out of time here. Um, wonderful uh, presentation by all of you speakers here. And uh, I would like to kind of sum up this, uh, this event in the Company of Wales to giving you the ideas that you were presenting here. If you think about whales who are social mammals, they are very intelligent and they have a very big brain and, and uh, they just just to think about it, what are they spending all their time with? We use our hands to manipulate and, and dominate our environment. The whales have a much longer evolutionary history than us. And I myself, as a, as a scientist, this is not a research question, it's just an idea. Since I've been spending 30 years of my life in the water, looking at the whales, kind of looking at what they're doing, but I'm all, always also thinking, what, what exactly is their life about? What are they thinking? What, what are they using their all intellect uh, about what is their way of interacting with the, with the world. And I think if we go in deeper into that kind of thought, we might learn some very important messages also about ourselves and what might our lives be about. How to use our intelligence, which we all know right now that we <laughs> as a species are not doing very well. And maybe there are some lessons we could learn. Thank you all. Brilliant, thank you very much. So a massive thank you to Thieu, Olivier, Philip, and Aline. So for me, what's amazing is, and we talked about conversations, is having you know, a mix, whether it's engineers, composers, writers, biologists, all being so passionate about whales and all talking so eloquently about it. So now is the time of moving around. I'll just quickly tell you what's happening in the different um, zones. So uh, if you want to carry on with whales, Olivier's uh, movie is in Cine 2. So I don't know if he's going down there, but maybe you can have a chat to him in, the, in Cine 2. We've got um, a philosopher, Pascal Buchner, in the Salon 1, and he's going to talk about the idea of eternity. So would you like to live forever? Uh, so probably...
subject was about, and I thought, you know, I should get dressed, and how should I get dressed? Uh, and I was a bit stressed, like, so I'm, you know, I work for PwC, I'm an accountant, and gray suit, white shirt, very safe, you know. I've got leather shoes, and then I've got my kids telling me all about those amazing trainers and the fact that some of them are worth thousands of pounds. But I thought I'd come safe, and hopefully I'll hear in the next panel how I should have uh, dressed, how we can use sustainable fashion, and you can tell me all about that. So I'd like to invite on stage Maya Morgenstern, who's going to be our panelist. She's the journalist and editor of Culture Alt, Alt. Uh, and then I invite as well on stage, I've got François Guillain-Morillon, and you'll introduce them, and then Nicolas Lola, please. Um, thank you very much. And we were supposed to have Vin. Unfortunately, Vin was today with Prince Charles, as you do. Uh, he was in Scotland with Prince Charles, and because there's some issues with trains in Britain, I'm not going to... I think there's, I hear there's some <laughs> nationalisation... <laughs> His train got cancelled, and so he tried everything. He tried everything. He's watching. Hello, Vin. And I know we've got a, a movie, we've got a film that we'll be showing. So over to you, Maya. Thank you very much. Thank you. So hi, hello, I'll just quickly introduce myself. So my, my name is Maya Morgenstern. I'm a culture journalist and the founder of Culture Alt, which is a Franco-English uh, magazine of podcast interviewing um, cultural icons. And uh, we're missing Vin, but we have the extreme pleasure of having uh, two speakers uh, here. Uh, François Guillain Morillon, the co-founder of uh, Veja. And I don't know how many people are French in the room or know the brand already. Maybe it might be a good idea to have a show of hand if you've heard of here we go. <laughs> so if you turn around, you can see most of the people in the room have heard of the sneaker brand. That's a bit later on. Next to him, we have uh, Nicolas uh, Lawler, who's a senior footwear designer for Vivian Westwood. And um, Nicolas has been working in the fashion industry, sorry, for many, many years, uh, designing shoes, working with Alexander McQueen. Her design has been shown uh, at the Met. Uh, and we'll talk about also her career and how sustainability in both their practices uh, come into play. And so before we start the panel, because Vin cannot be here, but he really insisted uh, to somehow try to see, we could see his work a little bit. We watch a short video and then we can start uh, the discussion.
Thank you very much. So there, there's a lot of um, information here. And um, well, thank you, Vin, for this video. And we'll talk about a lot of these topics. And there'll be an opportunity at the end of this for a Q&A if you want to um, address anything else. Maybe I wanted to talk, um, start talking with you, uh, Guilain, and about the birth of um, Veja. I mean, you studied economics. So you were not destined to create a sustainable brand. No. What happened? The, the brand started um, from a bottle of vodka. Um, we were back in 2003, uh, 2002 actually, and we are um, we are we have graduated from uh, business schools. We are uh, interns in investment banks in New York. Me and Sebastian, uh, my best friend from um, school, and um, we are desperate because the internships are going to an end, and we're like, okay, we, need, we are we going to do this as a life? Um, and we went to the deli, we bought a bottle of vodka, we went up to the, to the terrace and we started drinking. And um, sometimes good ideas come from drinking. And um, the first idea there that we had... There are some children in the room <laughs> underage. Don't do that. Don't get ideas from that, please. <laughs> so the idea was not Veja. The idea was to travel the, year, to, to tra travel the, the world for one year to get down to the ground, because we were working in, uh, in towers in New York. And so the idea was to really go to, the, to the, the man level in the world and to study. And we just not like tourism. We wanted to, to understand what was going on with the world on a sustainability basis. Because it was the time that people were starting to talk about sustainability and how companies should uh, be sustainable and blah, blah, blah. And we were like, what is this? Is this real or is this bullshit? And that was really our angle. Okay, let's see what companies are doing. And so we spent one year and we had the idea of, okay, maybe we're gonna open a consulting company or something like that. And so we studied uh, uh, 60 projects around the world uh, in partnership with big French corporations. So we went to China, to factories, to oil and gas projects uh, in China, in India, in South Africa, and in Brazil. And we, it was a great deception, to be honest, uh, because everything we saw was greenwashing with marketing. But out of the 60 project, one project, the only one that had not paid us, actually, it was a startup company, and it was a fair trade company. And um, they sent us to the Amazon forest in Brazil to uh, make an audit of a cooperative that they were working with. And there, we saw something. We were like, okay, these people are buying directly to uh, uh, producers. They were small producers uh, producing palm hearts uh, uh, in, the, in the forest. So it was an agroforest uh, model. So the people are harvesting their, their palm hearts, but they're not destroying the forest. They get good money for this. There is no need for a big partnership with a giant NGO. It's just like a simple economic relationship. And thanks to that, to that uh, um, premium, that fair trade premium, the people respect their environment and because they live well from it. And there we realized that there was something with this fair trade model. And when we came back, we did our reports to the big corporation and they didn't really care about it. So we realized consulting was not an option for us. We needed to do our own stuff. And um, that's where we had the idea of Veja. Let's do uh, sneakers, like the ones we love, that the ones that, that we have always been like collecting sneakers. I know it's not very inter intelligent, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's who we are, like sneaker fans, uh, sneaker addicts. And uh, we said, okay, let's do the sneakers of our dreams. Let's do sneakers that respect the people that are making the sneakers, that respect the environment that is behind. And that's where it all started. So we went back to Brazil and we deconstructed the sneaker to understand how sneakers are made, what are the materials that are involved, and we tried to find the best supply chains possible. And that's how it all began. And after six months, finding organic cotton producers um, uh, uh, planting uh, uh, in the northeast of Brazil and also a cooperative of rubber tappers in the Amazon forest. We created our first sneaker that we show on a trade show in Paris and the buyers started, started to like it and we had our first production, 5,000 pairs um, in 2005 
And then we started to grow into, yeah, we grew and today we produce um, over two million pairs a year uh, with exactly the same concept. And now let's turn to uh, Nicola. I mean, you are now with Vivian Westwood, but you also had your own brand, uh, started your own brand in 95. And can you tell us how you came to fashion and sustainability? Um, well, is this working? Yeah. Yes. Um, a story I was going to tell was that in 1992, uh, we had a small design company. We just started when we were at college. We had no idea about business whatsoever. <laughs> and um, we made some shoes out of salmon skin. Uh, we found someone who was tanning salmon skin. It was a waste product from the smoked salmon industry in Scotland. And we thought it was a beautiful material, it was strong, it worked for shoes, and it was also being thrown away. Uh, so we, we made the shoes and presented them in the collection. It got picked up by the press at the time, and, um, but really n in quite a gimmicky way. And actually, I have a slide. Sorry, I have too many things in too many hands. Is this working? Oh, no, it's gone to the next one now. So this is rather embarrassing, but anyway, but this is me in 1992 holding a shoe made out of salmon skin. And we were on the cover of the Times, and there were lots of very terrible fish pun headlines. And uh, we were on breakfast television, on the radio, but no one was really interested in the sustainable angle. So 30 years ago, and come to the present, Things have changed so much. We're seeing the world in such a different way and people are really worried about the impact on the environment. And it's amazing that in that short, well, I say short space of time, you know, how our outlook has changed. And now we're really all saying, what can we do about what we're doing to the world? Um, another thing I was going to talk about just in introduction was that these are the shoes I'm wearing now. So a lot of the work we did with Lawler Duffy, and I've always loved, is that we work with the Northamptonshire Goodyear welted factories. And these factories are really like an industrialized version of a very old shoemaking technique where the uh, soles are stitched onto the shoes. So really they were originally sort of pre-glue construction. Uh, these shoes I had for five years, and I wore a hole in the sole just before Christmas. And I had them refurbished at um, Joseph Cheney. And these are the shoes that came back in the box last week. And you can see they've got completely new stitched on soles. And so they're completely renewed, and hopefully I'll wear them for many more years. Maybe we can actually address this, the natural aspect of the show. I mean, this we're going back to craftsmanship. And with you, maybe we can go back, uh, Guilain, going to Amazonia, the caoutchouc um, is uh, the rubber, sorry, is natural. Can you talk about the natural elements and how you pick up in nature things that will be used to build your shoe? Yeah, we, we usually the brands, like when you, you do, uh, you, you want to have a shoe brand, you go to a factory and you ask them to construct a shoe with, you send your design and it stopped there and the, and the factory sources rubber from the market and they, and they, they, they source like a canvas but they don't really know where the materials come from and because everything today is become commodity like what is a commodity it is commodity is a number is like the rubber it call, it's called in brazil it's called geb1 it's the name of the the rubber, like it, you, it, you can, it has a price, a market price. Uh, it's like a stock exchange, and every day it changes. So people will change their sourcing because of the price. So when you buy rubber, when a factory buys rubber in Brazil, they don't know if it comes from um, Indonesia, from Brazil. And we said, come on, there must be a way to do different, and it's to go to the source, to go to where the, exactly what you say to nature, to where the people are producing. So this is why we call it deconstruction, because we did the whole, the whole way, uh, like we, to, we took the, 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 the sourcing map and we took it upside down. So we, we tried to go the other way around, from the rubber tappers, from the cotton producers, not the factories that, that do the canvas. No, 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 the people that plant the cotton. And we visited them. And we started building an, uh, a partnership, we call it an alliance with them. 
And this is ex exactly where the story starts. And this is what makes us uh, uh, get up every morning because this is something totally different than what other people uh, do. And you know, when we take our, our staff to visit the producers, they see that there is a, a story, a human story behind it. It's not just like marketing or we know these people and we have relationships with them and the price is not the market price, it's a price that we negotiate so that they can live from it, that they can uh, enjoy producing and they know what it, what it is for. So we try to reconnect people through uh, uh, a shoe. The shoe is just an excuse. You're very close in that sense to agriculture. Can we say you're sort of like growing the shoes from the ground? Yeah, no, I mean, I think we are the only shoe company that have uh, so many people linked to agriculture. We have uh, 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 really uh, uh, three people that are every day uh, on the ground and we're gonna hire some two more this year to visit the families and to work close, close to them. So yeah, that's a kind of a weird company. I mean, that, that being said, you're working with people that are very far away from here. We're here in, in London. And we thought the problem with sustainability most of the time is transport, cutting fuel, trying to make the global more local. So maybe this is for you, Nicola, having work with Vuitton and the biggest brands we can think of. As, as, a, as a designer who cares about sustainability, how do you work with these brands within your constraint to you have a global brand and still be responsible. Is that even possible to grow something globally and, and stay responsible? Well, possibly not. <laughs> but I mean, in terms of, uh, I mean, as you mentioned already, you can localize your supply chains, but, um, and you can try and make things much closer, but it is very difficult because most companies have this aim to be global brands nowadays. So whatever you do, you're gonna then send it all over the world, you know, at the end and maybe ruin the, the carbon footprint of every, all the other work you've done. Um, so it is very difficult. And I think as Francoise touched on, I mean, obviously when you're focusing very much on a particular kind of product, like sports shoes, then you can really take apart and analyze every part of that supply chain. But in fashion, in high fashion, for example, you know, one moment I, I'm, I need to design a high-heeled shoe with 10 centimeters with steel inside and made of certain materials, made in certain kind of way. And then the next minute I'll be making a sports shoe, the next minute I'll be making a sandal, you know, and all of these things are made in different ways, by different factories using different materials. So it's, without just saying it's really hard, <laughs> it's not, it's a big challenge because you can't start from scratch every single time. And I think, I think the best way for bigger companies is to look at the things that they make over and over so say like, I'm trying to think of an example with a shoe, but if you have a classic shoe that you always make every season, something continuative, then it's much easier to really analyze the supply chain of that shoe and the materials that go into it. So maybe bits by bits, breaking yes, it, breaking you it down. you have to start somewhere, otherwise you just get completely But well, it's much <laughs> easier when you have a mono yeah. product, so yeah, maybe, that's, that's, you know, you want to It's not like easy, not I mean, agree it's more. amazing <laughs> what they've done at Vega, Vega. I mean, I think it's absolutely amazing. And so it's how do you maybe, yes, um, how do you address it? I mean, you have one product and you, you can control. She has to respond to a brand brief. You decide on the brief. Yeah, but we have a creative team and, um, and of course they have also some crazy ideas. And I mean, we've done some things in the past like, okay, let's do a silk collection. Okay, so we go and look for uh, a silk producers and we, we build the whole supply chain. But then we realize after two collections that silk is not gonna stay in the collection because it's, it's fun, but it's not something that we can work with continuity. So the lesson we learned, okay, we don't go into these crazy things uh, again, because this is not going to be sustainable in, in the terms that it, this is not going to stay and uh, we're not going to build a relationship there. We're just going to switch from supplier yeah. to supplier. So, um, so yeah, this is a constraint. But again, for us, it's the whole fun is there. Is really when I, like in two weeks, I will join my, my sourcing team in Brazil and we'll travel, we'll visit the families. I think there are some families that I know 
for 15 years, so I've seen the kids grow, and, and, and for me, it's, it, it is this. This is the, 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 the pleasure that I have to work is there, uh, more than to do a, a silk collection that was on American Vogue, or uh, which did, but, but <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I, I think, and, and I think the people in the company, they valorize this, um, and they, they start to, to see this as a challenge, but also as a, as a great uh, opportunity. Uh, Nicola, you mentioned something earlier about uh, comfort. Uh, this is a big topic, especially in fashion. I mean, we don't need technically anything, parachute for life, but this is not how we work, as a, especially as a society today. How do you go between um, basically aesthetic versus ethic? I mean, it's very hard when you have the constraint on having material that's maybe not as flexible, not as comfortable. You have a lot of constraint. How do you choose between being uh, aesthetic and being I take, especially with high heels, I guess. It could be quite difficult. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot more considerations. I think, I don't know if, these, if there's some pictures actually here, but I mean, most. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, this is a, maybe, yeah, that's a good start. So, I mean, in high fashion, really, we've got so many considerations when we're designing and we're thinking about practicality, we are, believe it or not, <laughs> and, um, but we have technical considerations, we're also thinking about fantasy and dreams and trying to appeal to people's imaginations and think of something that will really capture you and something you've never imagined until you see it. Uh, we're also, we also do think about comfort. I thought I had an example for protection, you know, what is a shoe? A shoe could be a dream, it could be protection, it could be uh, about enhancing your performance or comfort, this was a comfort thought, or, you know, just um, creativity, and probably not so much comfort in that one. <laughs> but, um, <So. laughs> I forgot, I've sort of lost my thread of what I was saying there, but the, we have all these different considerations, and now on top of all these considerations, we also have sustainability. We're also under a lot of time pressure. We're on a merry-go-round of seasons. Uh, we have to make sure things aren't too expensive. There's other things I've probably forgotten in the list. And I'm not trying to say that it's all doom and gloom and it's really hard, but there is a lot to think about and you're working very, very quickly. You can't pick every little aspect of the collection and do a circular analysis on it. It's just not possible, but you have to start somewhere. Well, I mean, that's yeah. why it's interesting to have the two of you, because you yeah. did the other way around. You started with the premises that it would have to be sustainable. And if yeah. I made the first shoes at the very beginning were maybe a little bit stiffer than yeah, what they are now. True. That's, that's true. Um, and, and I think it, everything does not have has to do with sustainability. It's also that we are getting better in shoemaking. <laughs> so I think we are, we are having uh, uh, better uh, people in the team that work with us and, and um, that can work on the leather and stuff like that. But can, can uh, share with you what, uh, what we started four years ago. We started a, a, a project that, that maybe can illustrate this, conf this confrontation between aesthetics, comfort, ethics. Um, we, we decided that our next uh, step as a company, uh, as a brand, was we're going into sports. And we, our dream was to do a running shoe. Because, you know, we were getting in our 30s and uh, starting to have to run to, to, <laughs> to be fit. And um, we were running with um, other brands. And um, we were looking at the shoes and we're like, oh my god, but it's all plastic. Uh, if you look at the sole, the outsole, the midsole, the upper, the laces, is basically everything is polyester. Uh, so we're like, okay, this is a challenge. How to do a running shoe that is sustainable, that can uh, be in the Veja line. And um, so we started doing some research. We did a, a um, and the idea was, okay, let's do the first post-petroleum running shoe. That was the brief. So uh, we hired two, uh, two specialists. One is a chemist. One is more like a marketing uh, a guy from uh, the running industry. And uh, we did a, a technical a partnership with the university in Brazil, working on rubber and latex and trying to, to break that polymer so that it can be light. Um, 
and we put all these people around the table and we went to see all the suppliers that exist that sell uh, uh, plastic uh, or p polyesters and all these polymers that make foams and stuff like that. And as we were already a brand, we could have these people working with us to find solutions uh, to try to diminish the, the, the part of, of uh, petrol in the, um, of oil in the, in the shoe. And what we thought would be a 0% uh, running shoe, like zero petrol running shoe, actually, after four years, we were very happy to launch a 53% um, bio-based running shoe. So that means that we still have some work to, to do but we entered an amazing world of uh, bio-based polymers, of sugarcane, of banana oil, of, uh, of many, many things um, that we will still need to go back to the, to, the, to the agriculture on all of these products. So I think it's a lifetime <laughs> project. But um, so again, this is, for us, this is what makes, what makes the fun, you know? If it's just to make another running shoe, I mean, the other brands do this very well, and I think there is no need. Uh, for me, that was, that was, there's no excitement. But okay, to start to work on a post-petroleum running shoe, that's, that's where I think we can, we can enjoy. And uh, this actually helped us a lot to improve the comfort on the other shoes. For example, the shoe I'm wearing is not a sports shoe, but it is already with the technologies that we developed for the running shoe. So. Nicola, I mean, working on, on bio-based uh, mm -hmm. product because that you work with salmon skin, so you know exactly what it is to work with something that's, that's a waste and reuse it. And um, Vin, who's not here, has worked with Prince Charles on uh, doing outfit out of nettle. Yes. So how does working with natural material that you can find in everyday life affect, I mean, your creativity? Sounds very broad, mm -hmm. but does that have any effect on the design you're going to create, let's say, for Vivian Westwood or the other brands? Well, I think you can always be inspired by materials, for sure, and I think going way back to salmon skin, I think the aesthetic qualities, the texture of it were a big part of the appeal. As Francois was talking about before the talk, you know, people want sustainable product, but ultimately they want something that looks great, that's beautiful, that appeals to them. And if it's ugly and brown, it doesn't matter how sustainable it is, they don't really want to wear it. Um, but I think innovation in materials is, is expanding massively and it's quite mind-blowing to navigate some of that information. And I think what you said about all the work to go into a 50% or 50-something percent um, petroleum trainer is really... I don't think people realise how difficult it is to sort of, sim you know, to imitate these plastics that we spent a lot of time in the 20th century producing these amazing materials that are flexible springy light resistant but they don't break down and no one knows what to do with them now but no one really thought about that before and then as one other thing i was going to say about a shoe really is that a shoe is lots of different materials including plastic maybe leather fabrics, glues, metal, all stuck together so you can never get them apart. And if anyone's ever tried to take a shoe apart, and I have, <laughs> you know, and it's really, really, really difficult. So to think about after someone doesn't want to wear a shoe anymore, what, what do we do with it? I think that's a really big question. We, we plant well. it and uh, yeah. we'll make a tree out of it. <laughs> but uh, go, I would like something you would like to address that is quite important, starting with you, uh, Gila. I mean, you're wearing your shoes. We can call that advertising, I guess, uh, which is fine. That's well, I'm, I'm, no. <laughs> I, mean, look, I don't think I'm the, I'm the good model for <laughs> But that's where, I'm, that's where I'm getting at. I think you, you can understand. So you, you don't do, your brand doesn't do advertising. And the point was, you were really strong about it, was that all the money would go back into the business as opposed to billboard. And um, uh, Vin was not here, on the other hand, has used a very public figure like Prince Charles to promote something that he believes in. So where do we find the balance between using endorsement from a public figure, and sometimes that can be tricky. I mean, if we remember like the, the golfer and uh, Nike, uh, Tiger Wood didn't end up so well. So you, you get attached to another brand, I guess, or letting the product speak for itself, but you can never be discovered. How, how do you find 
that, that balance? Yeah, first, first, just to explain that we decided not to advertise mostly because of our business model that we pay uh, a lot, uh, I mean, we pay the, the more than the double for every material that we use, from the rubber, from the cotton, from the leather. Um, we, wor we work with Brazil, so we, f we make all, of sh all our shoes in Brazil, so the cost of this is three to four times the cost of China, for example. Um, so if we advertise, then we are a luxury brand. And that was absolutely not the idea uh, at the beginning. We wanted and we still want our brand to be worn by like uh, people like us, actually. <laughs> like, I, I don't know, we, I, and we, we're not, we don't fit, I don't think we fit in this luxury world and we pretty much do the products for us um, in the first place. So um, that was the rationale about not doing advertising and yes, uh, investing all the money um, and having a, a, a smaller margin, but paying better the people that work with us. We think it makes sense. I think we're not big fans also of advertisement uh, and receiving all these messages and we don't really believe it works. So there is also something like that in our uh, appeal and that if a product is good enough, then people will actually uh, buy it. So uh, it's a bit more than just an economic model. I think it's also a cultural thing that we believe in the like, intelligence of the, of the people. And, um, and then endorsement, we don't, uh, yeah, we don't pay people to wear our shoes, but I think it's, it's a bit of the same thing. You know, if, if the shoes are good enough, people will naturally uh, wear them. So when Meghan Markle, for example, uh, posted a picture on our shoes, of course we were happy, <laughs> but we didn't pay her or we didn't even give her the shoes. She bought them um, and I think she can, so that's... Um, <laughs> And actually, we received tons of emails of these people, or like like the stylists of these people. Um, and actually, I think they like when we say, "Come on, you can buy them." <laughs> 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 which which color do you like? I mean, it's 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 online. It's easy. So. Um, um, and another question that, that that brings we've been talking about sustainability, taking uh, for granted that we know what sustainability means. You talked at the very beginning about greenwashing. So just to, to reset the, the balance, cotton, as we know, uses a huge amount of water um, to, to grow, and, but it's natural. Take polyester, a lot less water, and, but it's made with fossil fuel, which is um, not biodegradable. Bamboo is natural, but you have to wash it with a lot of chemicals to make it into a fiber that's soft and usable. And uh, rapeseed oil is just uh, terrible to grow. So there's a lot of examples and, and our resources, planet resources are depleting. We know we're talking about this every day. So at which point do you think sustainable will be using man-made polyester horrible products? I mean, is one day using um, salmon skin going to be considered actually horrendous for the planet? Hmm, this is a tough one. <laughs> it's a difficult <laughs> question. I mean, it's, I don't it's, have the answer. I, I, I agree, and I think sustainability is um, actually a word that we don't really use uh, in the company. Uh, we prefer to talk about sourcing and start to like to think about smart sourcing. And as as you said, we learn every day about these things. And like for example, recycled polyester a couple of years back was amazing, perfect. That solves everything. Uh, you know, you're, you're recycling uh, plastic bottles, blah, 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 it's amazing, or ocean, like plastic from the ocean. And then you start to realize that actually using this polyester, you're breaking the recycling, the recycling cycle because the shoe will not, get, will not be recycled. So it's better that a plastic bottle, well, it's better that a plastic bottle does not exist in the first place, but <laughs> if, it, if it is created, then it has to turn into a plastic bottle and again and again and again. So, I mean, we have to create, uh, for our company, we create rules. Okay, if we use polyester, why do we have to use polyester? Because it's much more rigid than cotton. For example, for the lining of our regular shoes, like we use cotton. But for the sport shoes, we use po uh, a mix of organic cotton and polyester, uh, and polyester. So when we use polyester, we only use recycled. We know it's not, it's not perfect, but it's better than the virgin one. So there is no virgin polyester in our shoes. When we use cotton, we use only organic cotton. So this is like the principles that we can 
Um, and there are some guidelines uh, um, called the, prefer the, the preferred materials guidelines. Um, as a working group that uh, that every year uh, uh, makes this report about what the f what fibers should we use, and we do life cycle analyses, we do carbon footprint analyses. So we getting every year we're getting more knowledge about what to do, what not to do. Uh, but yeah, maybe someday we'll say, okay, no, salmon skin is horrible. Nicola, do you want to bounce back on that? Having made shoes out of salmon skin. I'm not. I'm not necessarily defending salmon skin or any. Particular no, or just material, any natural product. Would that be one year product? Should we use man-made because we don't have enough resources? Quite possibly. I think we have to look at the use of resources, and if we can develop man-made materials that do break down after use or can be put into a circular system, then it, you know synthetic is not better or worse the natural, it's more to do with understanding the cycle. And as Francoise rightly says, the word sustainable is used a lot, but it doesn't really mean anything. There is no definition. But I think the idea of circularity, which is more a newer thing that people are talking about, but it makes more sense because it's all about the fact that you've got to, you can't just have an end where you don't know what to do with something. It has to be able to have go back somehow. Um, yeah. Just a, a little bit of uh, fashion news. Those are in a fashion uh, business. I mean, Stella McCartney launched um, Stan Smith's All Vegan in November um, of uh, just last year, 2019. She just launched, announced last week, Biodegradable Jeans um, as a collaboration with an Italian uh, brand. Um, I was just uh, looking for just, um, I mean, organic plant-based yarn, natural rubber, free of plastic, microplastic. Victor and Rolf, the next day, countered uh, something back and announced a collaboration with Melissa, uh, the shoe that, uh, the brand that collaborated with Westwood for, for a long time. Are we seeing a really change in the business or do you think it's something just cool to be doing? Are we addressing really the global market or is this just still for the like the one percent i think it's it's cool to be sustainable and then we'll move on to something else no, i really think something is changing i mean today um i, I went to a, a show called future fabrics um here in london at victoria um hall and um, the show has been running for five years it's basically only organic recycled fair trade uh, and innovative uh, sustainable materials it was almost impossible to get in that show because all the industry is queuing to enter this show. And I mean, so something is happening. I, I mean, it, this is happening um, and it's good, <laughs> I mean, finally. <laughs> so, I mean, th there are other brands like the, um, uh, what's called New, the Swedish brand that are offering, you were talking about your shoes and repairing them. Mm -hmm. They are offering to repair for free the pair of jeans that are selling, but I mean, it's, it's amazing uh, that they're offering so you can recycle your own garment as long as you bring it uh, washed and clean. But again, because it's free, does this mean that they have to up the price of the jeans to cover for that cost? And then again, are we talking to the happy few who can afford to do that? Well, it's, it's, still, a, it's still a good thing to do. And it's, it's, more, it's definitely more than a trend. It's just that there is no, it's no quick answer. And all these things can grow and contribute to making product better. I think there's a much wider um, problem to think about, which is basically that we just make too much stuff. And I think in, I don't have numbers really with me, but you know, we make- 80 billion pieces of clothing a year. Yeah. And that gives and, an idea um, of what we're doing. I think, I've, I don't think I've got it on here, but there are something like, 85 billion pairs of shoes made a year in the world. And three quarter and, um, in landfills. Yes, so it's and most the of them, not only in landfills, after people wear them, but never ever get bought or worn. And you know, this is a massive problem. And I think, I don't, I don't know how, I think the economics at the moment are that we just have too many companies, too many brands making too much product. <laughs> and um, I'm sorry, because I'm not trying Suicide. to kill us all, just kill us all. <laughs> I'm not, because I, I feel very optimistic, but it is, it is true. And I think, you know, mass 
production, these kind of scales that we work on now are a huge gamble because you're really playing roulette with like, let's guess that everyone's gonna buy ours instead of those ones or those ones or those ones. Mm -hmm. And we make far more than we're, than we're gonna sell. Maybe we edible garment. that much stuff. Edible garment, I think, is the future. Yeah, but and at least if all those fully. things broke down and went back and made flowers grow or something, that no, wouldn't be quite so bad. But yeah, and I think there is, a, there is a simple way to try to reduce this, mm. is control inventory. Because many brands overproduce, um, and then you have most of the things sold on sale. Mm. That means that all, all, of, all of these products that are sold on sale, were overproduced. They were produced in the expectation of a higher growth. And, um, and so I think this is uh, like something that, and we do this, and actually the economics is pretty good because then you sell everything at the full price. So you don't expect a, a, a two digit growth for that particular shoe or that particular market. But, um, and actually, actually we need to do this because we work with all the 2,000 families, so we buy them in advance, so we have the whole mm -hmm. thing to, to control. So we cannot just like, okay, let's, let's try and, 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 and buy, uh, like double the buy and see what happens. But this is, I think, what, what um, some brands do, and then there's all this stuff that is uh, overproduced mm -hmm. and then that goes to all these different channels. So. So I think maybe, I mean, we have to draw to a close so we can have a Q&A. And my last question, and I know you don't like it, so I'm still going to ask it. <laughs> it's uh, basically, at the end of the day, whose responsibility it is? Is it the, the company uh, making the product, or is it us customers buying it? And you can answer it. It's no, for you me don't only. Like it. <laughs> it's for both of you. No, no, it's absolutely for both of you. Um, well, I mean, I, th I think it's everyone's responsibility. Yeah. And I think it's very, there is a slight culture at the moment and it's very lazy to just put all the onus on companies and say you've got to do all the work and be responsible and now I'm just gonna go into the shop and pick things up and criticize them if they're not sustainable enough for want of a better word. Um, you know, governments have to do a lot. We have to legislate against, you know, very bad practices around the world where we pollute the, the rivers and we pollute the land and people get sick and people work in terrible conditions and it's not okay to do that thousands of miles away and then just send them over here and buy everything really cheap. Um, I think we have to put a lot more funding into research as well. I mean, I speak here more for my company, so I would say the company has to be responsible for what it does, and I have a larger impact as a company. Now, and you know, people usually ask, ah, oh, but when you, uh, your company now is a bit bigger, so I guess you're not that much into uh, uh, environmental, and, and you, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna uh, take it easy on these things. And uh, it's actually the opposite, because when you're a bit bigger, you have a much more, you have much more muscle to, uh, uh, to pressure uh, the whole, the, the suppliers. And I'm not talking just about the, the cotton and the rubber producers, but all these big uh, uh, suppliers that supply the polymers, uh, that, that, that like the, the, the industrial suppliers, they can change only if brands change. But at the end of the day, it's the consumers that push the brands. And I think we see today with the, 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 um, the, the social networks that there is, now there is a, a, a direct relationship with, uh, with the brands and the people. And, um, and you can see that the people are very interested in these things and that they are very critical and they question. And when, you, when, when we launch like a, a vegan uh, bio-based material, they ask like very technical questions. So they're, they're not like buying anything. So I think, uh, I think it's really a, uh, um, and I think we can take what happened in the food industry as an example so, so that we can follow that lead. Because today, um, it, uh, the organic farming is big because the demand for organic food uh, is big and still growing. So we're talking about 10% of the market. So in the, in the, in the fashion world, we're still like 0.2, 0 I think, percent uh, of the cotton. So. I think we have, uh, we, if we follow that trend, it's just getting bigger, but it's, it's a big transition. So it's not gonna take 10 years. It's gonna be like more like 50, I think. 
Well, on that uh, hopeful note, uh, please help me thank uh, Nicolas Lorler and uh, Guilla uh, for the panel. How, how long do we have for questions? Five minutes? Okay, so I'm so sorry. So I think uh, if you can pass the mic around. Um, there was, um, was there one from the French lycée who has been working really hard? If you can make a quick question from the students. And we'll try to make short answers, so we'll have to take a few from the floor. No alcohol. No alcohol involved, it's bad. Yeah. <laughs> Don't design was, on alcohol. I was just wondering, when we buy a pair of shoes, so how can we actually, as students, be more aware of the impact our purchases have on nature? I think you have your answer in your pocket with your phone. It's just ask the brand. <laughs> Um, you have a voice and you know on, if, if you ask the, the, the brand on the social network everybody sees it and uh, and the brand will answer so if you're interested in ah, what is the impact in terms of water what is the impact in terms of carbon uh, and if the people don't know at the brand I'm sure they will find the answer and if you if you keep asking can we take another question please right here in the front thank you Thank you. Um, fascinating talk and debate. Um, I am uh, uh, very curious to hear a little bit more of what you think um, of this question. A lot of times, perhaps even in one of the questions, there's always this implicit assumption that if we use something ecological, sustainable, it usually has to be more expensive because otherwise we would have used it. But in fact, um, there was something very curious because I've worked in uh, work in the university, and uh, I'm even curious whether you guys work with students sometimes to do this kind of design projects to to do what's next. But specifically, um, there was this big program in Unilever, for example, 15 some years ago, and since then they've become much more ecologically uh, minded. And at the same time, it turns out they saved a lot of money. And that was something that was a big surprise. So rather than actually being more expensive, sometimes sustainable ecological alternatives, when you start to focus your... Do you see some of that in, in the things that you do? Or do you hope to see it soon? <laughs> um, shall I say something? Yes. Um, I think, I think they, it can become cheaper as, as a you know, a process becomes more widely used and more efficiently made. So usually in the beginning when some, maybe a new material is being made on a very small scale, it might be very expensive, but if you can then grow that and make it more efficient, also making things more local can save a lot of money. I'm sorry, but I, I, I have a more <laughs> balanced view on that, and I think the answer is no. I think that the market, the industry, always, go for the cheap, always goes for the cheapest, and, um, and you have to insist to get something better, to, ha to get something... Uh, and, and also, because in, in, our, in my point of view, the, it's not only the environment, it's also the social impact of, of things. And usually it is, it is linked. So if you want... A better, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 like a, I don't know, like a, a fiber, for example, with a better, like if you take a very simple example, talking about a, a company that you can you can buy the fibers from, it's Lensing. They have four types of fiber, and it's really the cheapest is has the the the, the worst impact socially and environmentally. And I mean, it's obvious because it's only eucalyptus coming from Brazil, uh, and then. If you go up in the in the in the ladder, it would be uh, some. Uh, the fiber comes from uh, uh, forests in Europe that have more regulations. People are better paid, and blah blah blah. And then, and you know, it's 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 sad, but <laughs> it's like this. So uh, you pay for what you get, and um, and I think people should. Uh, and it's also why we are questioning the whole uh, advertising thing because. This money is lost in space. Can we have another question, please, over here? So the work that you're doing with farmers is very inspiring. I just wanted to understand a bit more about uh, how do you ensure that you get a fair price for them? 
Yeah, sorry, you're talking about the rubber or the cotton or both? Any of you farmer, like you, you, you mentioned that you're building a very strong relationship with them. You, long, you work on the long term with yeah. them. Yeah, so it's very simple. We organize uh, meetings. Um, and um, so we, we have, uh, like for, um, uh, let's take one example, the, the rubber. We have a, a renovation of the contract each year. Uh, and uh, before the renovation of the contract, um, we have two persons, so Bia and Sebastian, they go uh, to various communities and they organize meetings with the, um, the leaders of the, 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 uh, the because the, all the producers, they're not independent. They are, grew, they are uh, um, uh, reuni uni you, you, like uh, reunited in, uh, in associations and all the associations are members of a cooperative. So they have a voice inside of their organizations. And so when, um, when the price is not good enough, they will raise their voice and they will tell us. And um, actually, there is also a, a, a good way to see if the price is, you know, this, this is because, you know, we are talking about the market economy. If people uh, produce, it's because they're happy about the price. So if, if the contract, you know, we have an annual contract, so let's say it's like 5,000 kilos of rubber for, for one local association. If we see that the people are producing 6,000, it's because the price is good and they are happy to produce. If we see that they struggle produ producing during the year, we can sense that we have to higher the price. So it's also, um, sometimes they don't even need to tell us that the price is too low. We can feel that we need to higher the price because yeah. there's something wrong. Because they can choose between other activities. They're not uh, rubber tappers. They tap rubber, but they have also plantations. They have agriculture. They have, and, and the big enemy for us is, of course, uh, uh, cattle raising, because this is the option, the, the other big option they have to make money is to cut down the forest and put some cows in there. So this is why we also monitor uh, with the satellites to see what's going on in there. I think uh, we're running out of time, so one last thing. I would like to turn to Camille Aubry, who has been uh, making, <laughs> while we were talking, a drawing. Thank you very much. And maybe, Camille, you would like to comment on what you've been doing while we were talking. How did, how did the talk inspire you to create? Um. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, no, but I thought I we mean, should be also looking at what you're doing. Sorry, my brain is like a fog. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, quite inspired by the idea of being yeah, inspired by nature and how to innovate from there. And also finding the balance uh, between that and the fact that we still have to buy, still have to wear it, and we still have people watching us, watching what we're wearing. So yeah, I, I guess I just let it flow like this. <laughs> well, beautiful. It's Congratulations. Beautiful. <laughs> Camille, Guillaume, Nicolas, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just one second. So. Just one comment from me. I, I really love the question from the students, actually, and I'd love to get your input because... Um, Extra what, time. <laughs> just one. What I thought is, you know, if you buy some juice or whatever, you've got a label and colours and you've got big, bright red, do not buy that one, you've got loads of sugar in it. Right, I still don't know if my leather shoes are any good. Right, they are natural, there's no plastic, there's no anything, but what is the labelling that will help me understand whether it is properly recyclable, whether it's, is there any, anything like this that exists? There is nothing that exists, and to be honest, there is a big debate on whereas your shoes are uh, sustainable or not. So, and I think there is no truth out there yet on these. Um, there are, as I said, the life cycle analysis is maybe the, the most profound study that exists and most of the brands uh, uh, conduct these life cycle analysis. And what is a life cycle analysis? It gives you, uh, and people look mostly at the carbon footprint, and I think it's smart because of climate change, and then it gives you tools to choose between options that designers have when they create the product, uh, or when the logistic teams uh, chooses between uh, uh, options uh, of transport, and th so you have indicators but I agree that the final consumer is lost. And I think this is, I mean, the, the, uh, we've participated to a, a, a group uh, with the French government a couple of years back and they just desisted from the idea because it is so much pressure 
from the, the big brands that actually they cannot like do a, a proper environmental labeling on, on right. the, on so the product. So business idea for you guys. Have a, yeah. a glass of juice and then you can <laughs> you know, come up with one of these. So thank you very much. Really, really thank excellent you. panel. So very quickly, a recap of what's going on. So we're going to do a turnaround. So uh, in Cine Lumière, we'll talk about our digital lives. So I'll get on to that. In the Mediatek, AI and us. So you'd have uh, artists and AI experts um, talking about the, 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 the borders between artificial and natural, sorry. Uh, a bit of music in the salon. And then in Cine 2, in the machine, can robots feel pain? What about love? So see you shortly in this room for the next debate on our digital lives. Number six, is it? If you can just get the other chair and then it's the table then.
Right, I think we're going to be ready to start. Um, so thank you very much for joining us for, I guess, the second part of, uh, of the Night of Ideas. As I said in my introduction, there's, there's two sides. There's the potential doom and gloom um, as to where the world is going and, and the potential for machines to save the world and save everything. So we're going to move into the second part, which is talking about technology. I said at the introduction, this is the, my third year uh, being the MC at the Night of Ideas. And actually, I do have another day job. And my other day job is exactly what we're going to be talking about now. So I really look forward to, uh, to understand. And they're looking at me going, because, you know, was it about social media? Now, this is going to be about artificial intelligence. And my day job is to look after the digital audit team at PwC. And so what we do is find ways to automate how we do audit. So maybe you'll talk about that. How, and my kids describe it as, Dad, are you going to replace people's jobs? So I said, no, no, we're going to make it easier for people. They're not going to have to do the boring stuff. So that's really you know, the heart of, of what I do. And, and I think the next panel will be really exciting. It will be f able for us to explore machine learning, what artificial intelligence is going to do to help us have a better world, hopefully. Um, and so with this, I'd like to invite on stage uh, Greg Williams, who's the editor of Wired UK, um, which he joined in 2010 after a decade of publishing industry in New York. And then the three panelists, we've got Gaspar Koenig, Mercedes Bunce, and Lorena Rama Palassi. So if you could come on stage and I'll let Greg introduce you properly. Thank you very much. Welcome. How are you? Very well. Good. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm going to start the clock because we have an hour, and I've been told we mustn't run over. Um, welcome um, to what I think from uh, what I've heard in the green room is going to be a nice, uh, urgent, and spirited conversation. Um, so I'm just going to say uh, a couple of words to begin, um, really just from kind of the, the wired perspective. Um, I think that the big kind of um, top line view that we have at the moment is that the world is obviously undergoing this kind of big transformation from the technologies of, um, I guess, the sort of, you know, post-war era, the microprocessor, um, to technologies that are far more complicated, that are much more sophisticated. And what we're going to see over the coming years is probably a transformation that dr was as dramatic as uh, the move from the uh, agrarian revolution through to the industrial age. Uh, we're going to be seeing this occurring um, over the next sort of five to 10 to 20 years. Uh, and this is obviously going to have a fundamental tr sort of transformational effect on the world. Um, if you look at the most valuable companies in the world um, 20 years ago, they would be very similar to the most valuable companies 20 years before that. So the year 2000, the year 1980, it's probably going to be ExxonMobil, AT&T, um, a bunch of other companies that are usually kind of energy-based and uh, even maybe even an airline. You look at the most valuable companies in the world today, and obviously they're very different from that. Most of them are um, based on technology, and so we're the, the companies of the information age. And um, I think what's intriguing is that basically within the lifespan of everyone in this room, assuming there's no one here under the age of 20, although you all look incredibly young, um, that transformation has occurred, and it's been a really dramatic one. So hopefully tonight we're going to, uh, with our three experts, we're going to look at some of the uh, challenges of this. We're going to look at, you know, what does it mean for uh, technologies, uh, algorithms fundamentally, that are being written largely by uh, young men in Northern California, um, how we create ethical codes around that, how we create governance and standards around that, um, how we're going to uh, start thinking about automation and how our economies are impacted, uh, and how machine learning and its corollaries like you know, facial recognition, it's been in the news this week, as it becomes widely adapted, uh, we find ourselves in a world where it's increasingly hard to know how much agency we have as individuals uh, over contr control over our own lives. So uh, the way things are going to run, uh, each of the panelists is going to give a brief presentation, about seven minutes each, uh, and then we're going to get into a group discussion, and then we're going to open it up, open it up to the audience. So 
Um, let's begin. So maybe each of you could, uh, when you begin your presentation, just introduce yourselves and, and, and say who you are. Gaspar, maybe you could start. Hi, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'm a liberal philosopher, uh, and so I want to make clear, first of all, that I'm, I'm no expert, and it took me one year to travel to so many places who actually do artificial intelligence from US to China to Israel to Denmark to the UK to France, um, and try to, to, to get the gist of it, talking to people, because that's how I, I think we should do philosophy. We should go on the ground, we should go in the field, and make those connections that are missing today between philosophy and technology. Um, and then why, why was I interested into that, that rather dry uh, subject, in fact? Uh, it's, it's just that I, I read the, you know, this Homo Deus from Yuval Harari. And I think the question he raised at the end is the right question. It's not about the end of, of jobs. It's not about super intelligence taking over. I think it's pretty much overstated. Uh, it's about what happens in our, in, for our societies if we increasingly delegate our decision-making capacity to machines. If we presume, rightly or wrongly, that machines know, better, know, know ourselves better than we do, and if obviously we, we understand that they know our environment, they have more information about environments than we do, then we will entrust them with uh, uh, how we, we live, how we walk, what study we do, who we date, and, and progressively we will give up on what the Enlightenment had really provided us, which is the sense of the autonomy of judgment. So what happens in a society where you don't make autonomous judgments, because you think the machine knows better in every area of life. And you can see that happening already in the US. You have companies that match your profile with a certain type of jobs through machine learning. You don't have to enter any explicit criteria because an explicit criteria is considered as, as even deluded, you know. Uh, the machine knows you better than you what you can formulate. And obviously, it will impact different aspects of the way we live in society impact law. That's why some people in Stanford or in the European Commission are already thinking about granting robots um, a, a legal personality. Because if the robot has taken the decision and not the human, uh, then who is responsible in case of an accident? Uh, where should the insurance go? Uh, and, and so it's quite logical that in that world, you, know, you lose the sense of agency in the legal uh, way, uh, also in the economic domain, also in, in the democratic sphere, right? And uh, most people in the Silicon Valley are really convinced that a society would be better run if those companies, those big techs, were actually in charge of, of healthcare and uh, transportation, as they do in China. So that was my, my, my main concern. And I think that concern goes, what I discovered, I think, is that that's concern is also going against an intellectual backdrop, especially in the US, that negates the notion of free will. So you have a combination of psychology, you know, uh, and obviously Daniel Kahneman comes to mind, and very popular in the Valley, by the way, uh, who tells you that, in fact, we are full of cognitive biases, so we don't know what we really want. Um, no, uh, um, sorry, behavioral economics, who gives a justification for nudging people. You know, since people are not rational, but we will nudge them for what's better for them. And then neurosciences, which tell you that even the most possibly you know, rational decision you can make is something we can map, and that we know your decision before you've even formulated it. You know, the combination of all those different uh, sciences make it hard to resist the idea that you know, free will is just a sort of metaphysical uh, remnant of the Middle Ages. And let's be serious, you know, we're all determined by biochemical processes, and so we will nudge people into what's, what's, what's best for them because we cannot trust their own judgment. And so obviously AI fits in very well into that world. Um, I certainly don't have time to show you all the slides, but there is one which I find interesting. It's a startup uh, that I'm, I met in, in uh, Los Angeles, and it's been created by a former neuroscientist. And their, their motto is very simple. The brain is programmable, you just need the code. Right? And so what, what, what they do is that they sell instruments to apps in order to make their users addict. And they say it's very simple, and you can calculate you know, the, the, the likelihood of people getting addicted to an app. And you just provide them with the right notifications, with the right thumbs up, with the right like, with all sorts of, of devices that are obviously personalized. And that's what machine learning allows you to do, to personalize and to get under the explicit preference. And the same applies to dating websites and... Um, and to, to make it really, uh, probably to make it really, really short, um, 
Yeah, that's Kahneman. If you're interested, yes. Here you go. Uh, the intellectual father of, of AI as we know it today. And so, you know, AI is probably, AI, well, at least machine learning is, is ideologically neutral. But as it is applied today, as it is commercially applied, you know, taking, taking in the data of, of users and then nudging them back, it's, it's probably something that, that indeed increases the sentiment of heteronomy, you know, as opposed to autonomy of judgment. And that really sort of uh, uh, wipes out the tenets of our liberal societies that believe in individual responsibility, and that's my concern as a liberal philosopher. And so what, what we, we, I think we should do about it is not you know, move away from the technology. I mean, I met people actually in Berlin you know, who, who do that, who you know, try to, to create their own bubbles, so to, they have this method called obfuscation. Uh, where they create um, uh, clones of themselves on the social networks in order not to be identified, not, not to be traced. Not to right, but that, that will all only apply for a minority of very aware you know, activist individuals. But what do you do for the masses? What do you do for, for society? To, 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 so what you need to do, very simple, let's go to the, jump to the last slide. Yeah. So you know, they share some, some capillary, uh, obviously, similarities. Um, and, and these are the people I met whom I think are, are the most uh, interesting in terms of, of solutions and ways forward. To make it really short, the first one on the left is Daniel Dennett. And Daniel Dennett is an American philosopher and uh, uh, wrote a lot about you know, free will and how you accommodate the notion of free will in a deterministic universe. So obviously you take into account the, the, the results of neurosciences and there's no reason to uh, object to that. But his point is that you can be in the deterministic universe and still uh, assert the notion of individual responsibility through the capacity that we have to uh, 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 make internal deliberation. So what counts is not the outcome of your deliberation, it's the fact that you do deliberate. And even if that choice is suboptimal for the rest of your community, even if it leads to mistakes, um, this is your choice. And so that constitutes you as a singular human being, and that's what we should protect. But you should address that notion of, of free will before you move into the realm of public policy. And then there is this, on the, on the very top right, there is Raron Lanier. And Raron Lanier is, for me, a, a you know, fant fantastic technological you know, master of, of uh, technology and technology policy. And his whole point is, yes, obviously, we get into that, those filter bubbles and those nudges, why? Because we provide data, and we provide data for free. So what you would need to do in order to regain that, that free will we were talking about is to actually own your own data and decide for yourself who you share your data with and at which condition and at which price. And that's why I'm, I'm pleading at the end of the book, and that's the conclusion of my journey through artificial intelligence, uh, I'm pleading for uh, property rights on personal data. I mean, mind you, in at every stage of, our, uh, of the evolution of capitalism, we expanded property rights in order to protect the individual against any form of centralized authority. It started with uh, the, the, the peasants that were granted the right to own their own land. And I think we are now with the, the big platforms, we're really in a feudal system where we give everything for free and in exchange we get, well, we give everything and in exchange we get free services, but there is no contract. So there is no, in fact, economic contractual capitalist relationship. Um, and then uh, uh, when we invented the, the, the printing press, uh, a few uh, uh, centuries later, we expanded property rights to authorship. And then during the Industrial Revolution to uh, intellectual property. And I think it's quite logical that now we move into the realm of personal data, which are not subject to property rights right now. I mean, the aggregation of data is. That's why Facebook can make money out of your data and you don't you know, get everything, anything in return because the value has not been calculated. So Jean Lanier is a big proponent of that. And I think there is an economic element, obviously, to say, well, you know, now the value that we produce uh, is not being remunerated by the big platform. But there is a more fundamental metaphysical point because with property rights, you have fructus, okay, you can make money out of it, fine. But you have also usus and abusus, okay. meaning you can use and destroy your own data as you would wish so. Okay. So what we could imagine is to have a, a sort of smart contract in place where you decide the terms and conditions under which you want your data to be used. And obviously the, the more 
transparent you are, the more you get financial reward for it. The more close you are, because you want to stay private, then the more you have to pay to access those services. Okay. So you reintroduce a bilateral contractual classical economic relationship, which makes it much, much, much healthier. Because then you will, up, upload, up, you will um, sort of upload your free will up front. You will say, okay, I want to be nudged in certain areas, in certain criteria. For shoes, I have no problem. I share all my data and you, you give me the best shoes. For geolocalization, I don't want to be okay. traced ever. For health data, under certain conditions, for research purposes, and so on. And you will attach those terms and conditions on, which, on each of the data that you emit. And so you, in that case, you, would, you wouldn't click on the terms and conditions of the platforms. The platforms would come and click on your terms and conditions, and then that will uh, trigger a certain, of okay. course, economic relationship. And then you would say, okay, but you're alone against a big platform, how will you do that? Well, obviously, once you grant property rights, there will be intermediaries. And it's no surprise that banks and insurance companies are already looking into that, saying, well, we will take care of your data, um, and uh, uh, we will make sure that you get your contracted terms that you want, and then we will negotiate with uh, with Gaspar, the rest of I the have industry. strict instructions that we run on time and are afraid. And so the last person, <laughs> which I think is useful for us, is Margrethe Vestager, yeah. who frankly is exactly along those lines because she's a good social liberal, yeah. as uh, you know, the Scandinavians can, can, can do. Um, and she, it's, it's, it makes sense, right, that data ownership goes with antitrust policies. Because then when you regain your data and you can transfer them from one system to another, it of course increases competition and so your capacity to choose. So you know, to conclude, I think the, the major issue with machine learning as it is deployed today commercially is the notion of, of the autonomy of judgment that affects many areas of our societies, that, the solu that part of the solution lies into ownership rights, to gain ownership of those data and then decide where you want to be nudged. And that's something that Europe could do, could very well do. And that's the, the, the logical continuation of yep. GDPR in fact. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we need to move on. Um, Mercedes, I think you're up next. Yeah. I'm going to have to stand, not just so that you all stay awake, but um, I think otherwise I can't read my slides. <laughs> Right, I'm going to continue from that a little bit and go uh, a bit in another direction. I continue with the theme of AI, um, but I'm talking a bit more about uh, yeah, how AI, I mean, you all probably texted today someone, so you all have used AI because text recognition and the spelling help is definitely uh, driven by an artificial intelligence a program, but I'm going to try a bit to understand. So in my research, I'm a senior lecturer at King's College London. My name is Mercedes Bunz, and I'm quite interested where we position AI and how we misunderstand it. So uh, at the moment, I have two research projects, and I will talk a little bit about them. One is about uh, will machine learning relocate medical knowledge? Uh, that looks at a bit what Gaspar said um, about uh, the data that we give and who uh, can have the data. And the other one is a creative AI lab with the serpentine galleries. Um, but I will start to ask a question, and I'm very happy I'm in the Institut Francais because I want to start to ask a question with Laurent Gouron, who uh, was a French anthropologist. And um, he uh, writes about... Uh, very often, where is human intelligence situated? And the intelligence of the human thought cannot be situated in the brain alone, is one of his theses. He says it extends to the tool we think and work with, and by this he means tools as well as language. So um, where would intelligence be in a world, for example, where there are no books and nothing can be written down? Very, very different from where we are and sit now. So we can ask ourselves, where's our intelligence in a world with machine learning? How does it change? How is it very different? And that's one question where we go into. Um, so where do we currently locate our new tool of intelligence, machine learning? Um, how do we analyze AI? What's the role of AI in the medical discourse? Where do we see the intelligence in the medical discourse? And we did a bit of a research. We looked into newspaper articles of three journals from 1980 to 2020. Um, the Wall Street Journal, the Daily Telegraph, and the Guardian to have three of different political background. And we looked at uh, mentions of AI and doctor and seen how do we as a society negotiate 
where intelligence is. And the quite interesting thing, I mean, you can see uh, we start writing about AI in 1984, and it has massively, since machine learning came up around 2014, um, yeah, been published about more and more. So we have uh, 365 articles, and most of them uh, want to kick the doctor out. So uh, the tendons from the very first one, which is 1984's already expert system software finds place in daily office routine. In the article, they say the, uh, the system could replace the doctor. And then I brought you a few headlines. AI system spots childhood disease like a doctor. London hospitals to replace doctor and nurses with AI. How machine learning is putting a doctor in your pocket. And could machines use artificial intelligence make doctors obsolete? So it's very, very clear that the tendency of this discourse is to automate the whole human doctor, push it out, and replace it with a machine. Now, the interesting thing is, um, yeah, this goes even if you look at reports, that's not just something you find in newspapers where you find then uh, something like thinking on its own AI in the NHS. And if you look at the public sector, it's not much better. So in public perception, we have films like Ex Machina or Terminator. And again, the AI is an agency that automates and that sort of is threatening us. It's against us. It's automating us. It pushes us out. But um, once... My clicker's not working. Let's see if the AI works. <laughs> it's always so funny. Yeah, I think uh, maybe the battery ran out. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it works with you. Yeah, so my question is, but I need a clicker. You can also click for me if you want to. Is this real? Like that we are all getting <laughs> automatized when even the clicker does not work most of the times. Um, so how we discuss and depict technology, does this correspond correspond to how it actually works. So some of my work is uh, to look at how do we discuss something and how does it look when we look into the technological functions. So um, some of you might know a bit about neural networks and machine learning, but I think it's quite important to explain it very shortly. Um, so one very big difference between human intelligence and machine learning intelligence is you can tell a child this is a cat and one cat is enough for a child to understand this is a cat and to identify cats thereon. This wouldn't work for machine logic. Uh, machine learning needs thousands of examples to understand what a cat is. So it's a very, very different form of intelligence even though we always pretend it's like nearly human intelligence. And it's quite interesting to see that here in this display, you see the first notes where it starts to learn. Here goes the data in. Um, it looks at something that's really weirdly shaped. And that's quite important because it really can only see edges, dark to light, light to dark. It cannot see forms or anything. So um, this is a visualization tool that looks into a neural network, into the input image. And you can see some nodes see nothing because the nodes look at really, really very minimal differences. Light to dark, dark to light, shifts in, in color. They can't see a thing. They only see edges and shifts in pixels. And that's quite important because we come from this really difficult seeing. We have trained them so well so that they can identify images very well. So this is from the ImageNet challenge that's from 2016. I think um, it's much better now, but you can see that the pictures uh, got recognized correctly. Little girl is eating piece of cake. Baseball player is throwing ball in game, woman is holding a bunch of bananas, and so on. But this is my favorite, a young boy is holding a baseball bat. Or a cat is sitting on a couch with a remote control. Or the last one is a horse is standing in the middle of a road. Of course, there's no horse. Um, it has gotten much better since then, but the general problem remains that we can see here. Um, this is a recent paper uh, that came out at the University of Tübingen in Germany, and they found out that because machine learning sees so well when it's so weird when it does image recognition, um, it is very easily tricked because they are biased towards texture. So we see here very clearly a cat, and the machine learning is very, very certain this is an elephant because the cat is built in the form of an elephant. And because machine learning only sees those little edges, of course it thinks this is an elephant. 
This is quite important um, when it comes how machines can be tricked. Uh, this is a photo of a cat. In the beginning, the computer is very sure it's a tabby cat. It is, uh, has different tiger cats and so on. It could be a carton and could maybe be uh, a swap or a mop or a pot of flowers. But it is quite sure by 85% it's a tabby cat. The last one, this, in this image, just some pixels have been changed. The computer is nearly 100% sure it's guacamole. This is the picture it identifies. So this is quite important to understand how different machine learning works. And I don't want to give this talk to be against machine learning because I actually think it's really quite a good technology. But I think we need to understand that the intelligence of machine learning interprets our world by looking at the smallest element and calculating meaning statistically. Now that is quite extraordinary. We couldn't calculate meaning ever before. The fact that we can process meaning Images and language is a unique step in human evolution, so to speak, but it is also not that it understands meaning, it processes meaning, and that's a very difference. So uh, we have problems like this, uh, that self-driving cars are driving into pedestrians, or uh, Tesla autopilots go mad on the street because they miss something. And one thing uh, that we need to ask ourselves, if we keep on discussing AI as an autonomous agent, even though it has really mistakes, whose interests are safeguarded by this discourse? Why do we have it to automize things completely? Why can't we just have it as an assistant that helps us in doing some things better? And um, yeah, so the questions I, we can maybe discuss later is, who profits from us misunderstanding such an important technology? Um, I am trying to work, and these are my last two slides, we try to work uh, with a crew of artists if we can embrace the brittleness of our systems and their specific intelligence by understanding their strength and limits in our workings with technology. And, um, yeah, uh, we try to replace the idea of autonomous agents with the idea of collaboration. And the question that we have, because uh, you ha might have heard that a lot of times artificial intelligence is this black box. How can we open that? What kind of interfaces could enable an intelligent collaboration? But one problem that we all have is we want this collaboration. We need to start learning a bit more how it functions. And that's quite a bit of work. So uh, yeah, let's see if this happens. All right. So I'm the last one. I do have only one slide. Hello, everyone. My name is Lorena Yamapalasi, and I'm an ethicist, and I work at the intersection of technology and ethics. That means that I try to fool technology around to understand where are the ethical gaps in it, um, or that I think about what it means um, uh, at a normative level. This means that I also um, um, have to talk a lot with politicians um, and with lawyers trying to understand um, and make them understand how the gaps that we have um, intersect with law. And I brought you, because it all starts with the question of what is a decision? This is what, when, when we talk about ethics, when we talk about law, when we talk about agency, um, we need to first understand, okay, who's an agent, who's responsible? Uh, just to pick up on the last question that you were um, putting on the table, Gaspar. And I just brought you this slide. This is a visualization. Can, can it run? Can you please run it? No, I think. Can you click on it? Yeah, but it's interactive. It has a link. and. You're not able? Okay, so I will try to explain what this video um, was supposed to do. So what you see up there is this red thing. This is a program. Um, and this program is a program that is used to train um, autonomous cars. So this is a program about autonomous driving. This is um, a visualization of what we call genetic algorithms. This is what we call nowadays AI. This is quite sophisticated. And what the machine does, as you can see, is it sends fictitious cars and 
they move around until they crash to the wall. And you see there's a lot of cars. And it memorizes when was the last point in the wall where it crashed against. So it basically sends cars that crash and crash and crash and through crashing through the wall makes it way out until they found the door. Now imagine your daughter or your son learns to walk like that. Would you think it is intelligent or it's cognitively challenged? <laughs> what they do, those machines, is not making decisions. They do not learn um, because for a decision to be taken, both from the ethical perspective and from the legal perspective, you need first intentionality. Those machines do not have an intention. Then it needs certain parameter of freedom. If you're doing things because someone is about to kill you or you don't have time enough or you um, are not rational enough because you are under substance abuse or because you have some cognitive challenges, then you cannot be held to any type of responsibility and you're not considered as someone doing something, deciding something. None of them applies to this. So we don't talk about decisions here, we talk about programs that run and execute decisions that have been made in advance for a group of people that construct this type of programs. So those is some sort of to say it's um, conserved decisions that are being executed afterwards, independently of the context where these programs are being used. This is what is happening. And what that means is that um, artificial intelligence, which is not intelligent, um, is actually doing something that is challenging our societies, but not in terms of substitution of our capacities as human beings, as intelligent beings, but because it's mapping things in a different way. When we talk about algorithmic systems, which is basically what we call AI or artificial intelligence, which is rather more cultural term that really doesn't depict what it is about, what, what we're talking, um, what, what we do is we translate processes, social processes, into mathematical language. We talk about socio-technical systems, and this translation into mathematics let us not fool ourselves. It's a translation into a different language, but a language. And equally to other languages, it has its own implications about the world. It has its own implications about what is the standard that I need to put here. And when we talk about personalization in this context, what it technically means with these machines is not that you're getting individualized services, but that this type of technology is laying a fine layer of infrastructure, of immaterial infrastructure based on categories. And with those categories, um, those are very fine granular categories where people are being classified in a more granular way than they've been ever classified before. So it gives you the impression that this is an individualized service, but it's actually a program that is putting you in a specific drawer, a very specific drawer, than ever before, together with many other people. Because this type of automatization processes in the very end is based on average. And according to one of the famous mathematicians that wrote this book, Do Dice Play God? Do Dice Play God? Um, in average, every human being has a testicle and a breast. Because the average does not understand individuals. It's about finding the common denominator within a group. So this technology is very much about understanding things from an architectonical point of view, from an infrastructural point of view. It's about understanding the roots, so to say. And now the challenge comes because in our societies, in Western societies, um, in the end of um, feudal feudalism, we started thinking to contest power by bringing a different narrative to the power that we have been narrative that we have been legitimating before autocracies would say if we want a good city 
we need the good citizen. This meant that citizens had to be moral beings and they had first obligations and derivated from those obligations they had some rights. Now constitutionalism changed that narrative and said, okay, if we want the good city, we need first to grant all citizens rights so that they can cooperate with each other and trust each other. And out of those rights, some obligations are derivated. That's a narrative change. But what happened there in this discourse, that that part, um, granting rights, became the purpose, but actually was the instrument to get a society in peace and stability. The purpose in the very end was the very same purpose that autocracies had, to have a good society. But we forgot about that. In democracy, we started thinking that the purpose of a democracy is to grant everyone individual fundamental rights. And we forgot that our societies are, not, are more than the sum of all individual interests. And we started to create our own democratic woods by concentrating on the single trees. Societies are more than the sum of its individuals in the same way that woods are more than the sum of all trees. And this is the reason why um, people, philosophers like Philippa Foote or Richard Sennett or Habermas would point at our incapacity as individuals in our nowadays democracies to not only understand that individuals need to be put in the middle, but also understand that in our societies there is also a collective dimension, that there is a public interest dimension that cannot be addressed with individual normativity, neither mid individual ethics nor mid individual law. But our law is very much based on the individual. If you go and you want to address something, you need to prove at an individual level that you as an individual have been harmed. But there's a lot of harm that will happen with this type of technology that you cannot understand and address if you look at a single tree. You need to look at the forest. So this is the challenge that we're gonna have in our societies. Thank you very much. Okay, so there's a lot to chew on here. Um, a lot there in terms of the challenges we face, the, 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 just to understand the technology and the very kind of nature of the technology. Uh, Gaspar, maybe I can sort of start with you. Um, from, from what you were describing in your travels, to me, a, a lot of what you seem to be saying is that there's a kind of like a tension to some degree between kind of like a European model and, an, and maybe a US model, certainly kind of like a, a kind of libertarian US model. Um, is it that kind of, is it the case that really, you know, if you're talking about property rights, um, Silicon Valley companies are really um, incentivized not to think about these things, right? They're thinking, they're thinking about solely about delivering profit to shareholders and the fiduciary duty to, to shareholders. They're not thinking about, you know, property rights, personal and personal data. Have you seen any kind of examples of how this might work in 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 in, in, in the model that you're descri describing? It's smart contracts and people and, and, and companies actually asking for permission rather than consumers asking for permission? Well, first of all, you're absolutely right to point out that uh, uh, the way the technology is used really depends on the underlying political philosophy of the different world entities, you know, and uh, you can see the difference between Europe, US and China. We didn't speak about yeah. China, but I spent a lot of time in China. I was very impressed about the way they use data. Uh, I mean, they just don't care about, well, they see the forest very well in China, but they don't see the tree at all. Uh, and so everybody is very happy to share data. They call it the, the lake of data in order to benefit the community. Uh, what you have to understand about China, I think, is that it's not because they are cynical or because they want to um, oppress people. It's because they are Confucian. Mm -hmm. And in the Confucian culture, you share. You share and you, you are concerned with the well-being of the group. So if you are Alibaba and you're Confucian, it's very right that you share your data with the police in order to catch criminals. Because right. if you didn't do that, you would be a bad citizen. 
I went to discuss with engineers of Ali Hangzhou, you know, brain, uh, smart brain, brain, smart city, uh, city brain, as they call it. And they were very candid about it. Right? Of course, we share data with the governments because it makes society better. Um, so that's, that's a very clear way how they treat data. Um, then in the US, yes, you have this, this sort of libertarian streak, if you, if you wish, that what really matters, well, I would, I would call it utilitarian. You know, it's to maximize the happiness of the maximum yeah. number of individuals. And John Lenny is saying exactly the same. The Silicon Valley is meta utilitarian. And what that means is that what counts is the well-being of the community, which is why Google Maps doesn't give you the best itiner itinerary for yourself. Yeah. It gives you the best itinerary for yourself in order also to uh, alleviate the traffic for the rest of the group. That's yeah. why I met a Stanford professor who was very proud to tell me that he was beating Google Maps every morning on his way to work. <laughs> because he was taking the selfish route, you see? <laughs> So you see the utilitarian, you see the Confucian. And yes, in Europe, we have this classical liberal model where the government has always been very active to protect individual rights. I mean, when liberalism was born in the 18th century, it invented the modern state. It was not anti-state. That's a libertarian invention of the, of the 70s. And the government was created to uh, emancipate the individual from intermediary bodies. It was the whole spirit of the French Revolution. Um, and so we could just apply exactly the same principle. And say, yes, we, you know, the government, one of the role of the government is to grant people property rights. But not, not for any economic reasons. Because property rights allow you to deploy your singularity as an individual. I think the, the base case for property rights is made by Proudhon. Said, in fact, property rights give you a way to resist any form of centralized authority because you have something that actually really belongs to you and doesn't depend on, on any uh, external force. Now you're saying, do I see uh, you know, initiatives going into that direction? Uh, yes, very clearly. So from a, a, a legal perspective, from a sort of regularity perspective, regulatory perspective, this is being discussed quite openly by Margaret Vestager, that property rights and data may be in the, the agenda of the next European Commission. If you read very carefully her interviews, you see that it's something that is really between, between the lines. Um, uh, then there's been uh, uh, a few um, initiatives in that direction made by startups, you know, small startups. On one hand, wants to you know, monetize your data or allow you to, to take control of your data or give you, you know, smart wallets, for instance, of data, or even build data cooperatives. Because when you have property rights, you can do capitalism, you can also mutualize your data. Sure. So uh, I'm thinking of a startup in Lyon, which uh, allows you to you know, put your data in a collect collective, uh, collective pot, and then they negotiate those data with, with companies, and then you get rewarded um, with equal rights, as happens in uh, any cooperative. So I think, I mean, our sort of market economy institutions are well suited to the age of, of AI. It's just a question of applying those principles to the new technology, which we haven't done so far. Okay, in terms of applying principles, Mercedes, I'm interested to get your thoughts. Is part of the challenge here just like an education piece? Like we don't understand what's going on inside the black box. So demystifying that to some degree is, is, is very powerful. Maybe you want to jump in on this, uh, that as well. Um. Um, I, I'm, I, I will link what Gaspar Kuni sure. said a bit to your question, sure. um, because I think I would, and also to start off the discussion, um, I would think it's not enough to just say we have the framework that's going on. I think we have left um, in Europe as well, um, we are behind sort of a way of understanding public funding as something that's quite important to shape a specific technology. And um, I think when it comes to machine learning, and that was why I had this slide with all those thousand examples of data that needs to go in, the idea of privacy is just one idea that's important. The other idea that's really important is where does the data come from, where the machine learns from, if we want to call it machine learning or not. Um, so that's the question. If you look, I look at medical algorithms and medical um, research, and a lot of those uh, medical data comes from companies that create them themselves. Google, in the beginning, uh, when they started medical image recognition, had no problem to create 148,000 piece data set and had it graded each piece by up to eight doctors, real doctors, not 
no Amazon Turk. Now you can see how much a day, I mean, some of you have been to private doctors, you know how much an hour by a doctor costs, right? This data set costs about 250 to $500,000. If you want to compete as a smaller research institution, as a university, as a, even a small startup with Google, and on that level, you need access to this data. So one thing, for example, that could be done would be to push more uh, public data banks. It doesn't need to be that you can download it in medical research. It's quite normal that you apply for it. You show, you sh sign a contract, everything's secure, and you handle the data, sensitive, and then you can use it. But there needs to be an incentive. Now, coming to your question... So, so just sorry, one follow-up question on that. So do you think that large tech companies should be... Uh, encouraged to you know, create some kind of data commons specifically around medical data? I think I mean, that would be one, but I think we should also encourage the government to create data sets and to right. invest actively because we can shape where we want AI and where we want to see machine learning, yeah. but we don't, you know, we leave companies to it. And I think that would also then do the second thing. How do we open up AI? One thing is if we know which data gets in, it's much more open than if we don't know what trained the machine. Okay. Lorena, sorry, did you want to jump in? Uh, sure. Um, Kant was said, um, I'm master, but not, o but not owner of myself. Which means that fundamental rights, um, you you own your fundamental rights, but you cannot capitalize them. You cannot capitalize your freedom. You cannot capitalize your dignity. You cannot capitalize your privacy and so on. So there's one decision uh, that has already been made at European Union level, which is that this type of dimension is not capitalizable because it's a fundamental right. So we need to decide uh, whether we want this to be a fundamental right or not. Um, but it all, it all presupposes that you can point to a, to a specific datum and say, this is mine. But that's not the case. Data is something that happens as a result of our social nature, equal to language. Purporting that you can own data is purporting that you can own language simply because you're speaking. My birth date, it's not only my birth date, it's the date where my mother became my mother and it's the date where my father became my father and my sister became my sister. So if my parents want to go and ask for pension to the government, should they ask me for permission to get my birth date into their um, request? My mental depiction of someone running through the street um, being pregnant what datum is that? Because I am seeing the person, but the person is pregnant. Who owns that datum? It's just trying to think that you can assign this type of, this dimension of information and expression of our social interrelatedness is an expression of our individualistic idea to think that we can own and sell things. But there are things in our society that cannot be reduced to economics, and that is just one dimension of that. And of course, um, yes, these companies have these big data centers, and of course we need to get hold of that situation of big asymmetries with big companies, which, by the way, are not the only ones um, sort of marking the landscape here in Europe. It's quite different to what we think. We call big tech and we look and point our fingers to the US and China, but it looks quite different in reality. And I also know that because I work with a lot of them, I talk a lot of them, and um, I will go to that later. Um, but for that, what we need to think about this type of um, technologies, perhaps in a different way, in less individualistic way. We do know how to look at infrastructure. When we talk about infrastructures, suddenly we know that those are societal issues. Suddenly we know that it's about distribution of mobility. If we go through the highways, it's about distribution and access to energy. If it's about the networks for electricity, water, and so on, or telecommunications. And we know that 
thinking individually on that term is not going to work. This type of technology is pretty much an infrastructural technology. So if we start thinking of, let's say, Facebook as social infrastructure, what would mean that? That would mean that we would not regulate Facebook as if they were some other e-commerce enterprise entity because they are not the same that the cheese e-commerce selling entity run uh, around the corner, but they are something else. They are social infrastructure. The moment where Facebook suddenly disappears, we all have a problem, not at an, at, at an individual social level, but also at a labor level and also at an academic level and in many other levels. It has become, whether we like it or not, a part of our infrastructure. And we're thinking of it in terms of economization, but we're not realizing that we have a level of dependency that requires the legal instruments that we used to um, apply when it becomes to that type of critical entities. So I do think that instead of thinking of ownership and just bringing it to the individual level, we need to have a more, um, a bigger rethinking of this type of technology. We're not gonna, it, th this whole example that we, that, 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 that were you bringing with, oh, I'm taking the, the egoistical path with, it, it, that, that, that person was not taking the most egoistical path. That, that person was, was um, gaming statistics because statistics is not about the best decision for an individual, but it's on average the best uh, decision. We now have to turn to, I know you want to respond maybe on Gaspard, but we need to go to questions now from the audience. That, that, that's a fascinating debate. That's exactly the crux of the matter, you know, ownership or socialization of data. Okay, um, we need to kind of go to the Ask audience. Does anyone have a question? It, Maybe Gaspar, you want to answer that? And will anyone raise their hands? Um, anyone got, got any questions? No, Gaspar, the floor yeah. is yours. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's exactly the debate, and that's that's an argument I heard over and over again. Uh, yeah, that you know, data should be sort of in terms of formal rights, not in terms of capital. Uh, and that's exactly the argument of the European Commission in drafting GDPR, that the individual needs to be protected in terms of formal liberties. You know, that's my right, not, for instance, that the, the, the right to be forgotten is a right. It's not something that I can trade. It's not something I can monetize. I think in that reasoning, well, first of all, there is, but that's not the, the, the most crucial point. There is a sort of economic denial because our data, our personal data are already valued by those big companies and we just don't get anything in return of the raw materials that we provide. So they are already being monetized. All I ask is that some of the value is returned to the initial producer. But then there is a more interesting philosophical question. That's exactly what you said about Kant and the fact that I don't own myself. And I think that's, that's the debate of the 21st century, is do I own myself? Because the same concept applies to biotechnology. And I would push, and Locke, John Locke, was the first to have written in the, uh, uh, his, his second treaty on political theory, that I do own myself. Against what? Against the religious order. Because for St. Paul and the others, you don't own yourself, God owns yourself. And that's exactly at the center of the debate that we have on data and on biotech. Do I own myself? And I think the logic of the modernity, and I know it's painful to hear because of our religious uh, backgrounds, in fact. I'm yes, an atheist. Absolutely. Isn't the no, you're not. Painful. You're not. You're part of the same, okay, the same intellectual let's framework. Let's hear, what that you're to say. let's hear what Mercedes has to say and then go to you, Lorene. <laughs> I think I find the problem is a little bit. So the argument is out there quite, for quite a while now. Do I own my data? Do I not own my data? And um, well, it's very clear now that I don't just own my data, but also the one who creates the data structure where it's on has some part. Legally, that's unfortunately simply the case. Um, I think there are two things or several things here, and I think it's quite important that we go away from talking about data in general. I think it is quite important to understand that Facebook is a public sphere and that we have seen elections uh, from Brexit to Trump where there was interference, and we need to regulate that interference. And it's not even less important if I get my data or not. I signed up to Facebook on free will. You, for example, signed out and deleted your account. That was also your free will, so we can't, you know, say, uh, well, you know, they steal my data. Well, I feed them every day for free. 
um, it's my decision. So it's much more complicated than that, but I'm a bit afraid to bring something in completely different, just to entertain you all, <laughs> <laughs> that while we're still having this discussion, oh, what to do with my data, the, the question at the same point is not just about my personal data, but it's really about who owns all the big data sets and not, I'm not, I don't think like Facebook, okay, knows which shoe I like or not. That's important maybe for political, and it's quite important actually for political influence. But it's also about if it comes to medicine, if it comes to education, if it comes to energy, if it comes to all these other transport of everyday life, those companies that have data are stronger than other companies that don't have data. And at the moment, we don't care about who has those data sets that are not big names, Google and so on. And I think we're going away a little bit, uh, sort of we miss a discussion and we miss to interfere with that. And I think that's quite important for the infrastructure point you made, because we are losing the infrastructure to a purely economic infrastructure, while a mixture of both, in my personal opinion, is I think we're just about to get shut down. Can we do one, can we get, do one audience question? One last According one. According to my watch, we've oh, still very got time. Quick. Okay, very quick, second row there. Thank you. Uh, no, I, I don't, one question about like maybe shifting the debate from the data and the owning of the data to actually what we are currently doing with the data and about deep learning and what, for instance, as you mentioned, what Google is doing and being in healthcare, I think what's happening right now is amazing because we're able to process data to rate that we wouldn't have thought of like 10, 20 years ago. So my question is like the, uh, to me at least, the ethical debate should also be about like the uh, the, the application of like what we are able to do, and here this is like in terms of regulatory, right, what the government would be doing, and there would be big differences between different governments. Like for instance, uh, here UK, I mean UK, I mean like Europe, US versus China, and I think it would be important to, to talk about that too. Okay, I think that might have to be the yeah, final I think thought. Be another, yeah. Great, thank you, the three of you. Fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. I think, I mean, what this is telling me, what well, it's very complex, um, both in terms of the technology, but in terms of the thinking around AI and the use of AI. So we're entering into the final stage of the evening. Um, we're going to have in the Mediatek a really good question, which is how does science fiction has become so close to reality. So if you remember, you've much have watched all sorts of movies and suddenly it becomes reality. And for those of you who are gonna stay here, we're gonna be talking about robots and living with robots. So give you a few minutes to move around, stay here, have a drink at the, uh, the cafe if you want.
Right, can I ask you to take a seat? It's going to start in a minute or so, so if you can take a seat. So, this is the last panel for the day, and after this panel, I'd like as many of you to stay for the concert as well, because we'll have Rio be giving us uh, The Life of a Tree, an amazing piano concert, and there'll be some drinks afterwards as well. So, you know, quite a few things still to go tonight. Um, some of you might have been into this session or others around artificial intelligence. We've been talking about machine learning. We've talked about the use of data. And I see that we've got some students just joined us. So the big debate is should you give your data to all of these people for free using social media? I'll let you think about it. Uh, but the next session really is about robots um, and moving from the artificial intelligence to the real technology that no doubt is using artificial intelligence. So at home, I do have one of those Roomba that does the cleaning and goes around and hits the wall and turns around. So that's one of them. Uh, there's Sophia, who's the first robot who's got citizenship in Saudi Arabia. And so all of this brings all sorts of new debates and questions. So I'd like to invite on stage Rory Kethlan Jones, who's a BBC, no? Did I get it right? For a French man, it's sort of, you know, as, as pas mal, as good as it gets. Uh, who's the BBC News Technology Correspondent since 2007, so please come on stage. And I'll invite the two panellists as well who you will be introducing, no doubt. So this is Beth Singler and Sang Sok Yu. Pretty good. Pretty good as well, brilliant. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. What a crowd. I think I can see you. Any of you robots tonight? No robots. No robots here. Um, um, we are set for a fascinating, just under an hour, discussion about uh, what we think of robots, what, what it's like living with robots, uh, humanoid robots, um, uh, robots that live in factories, robots that want to come into your home and look after you. Uh, robot dogs that think they're real dogs but aren't. Um, uh, we're going to cover a wide field here. Uh, I've got a home full of robots, I was just working out. Uh, I've got um, uh, four called Alexa, who uh, pipes up from time to time. I've got a, about three called Google Home, who also intervenes from, uh, every now and then. And uh, I've got a washing machine and a dishwasher which, when you think about it, are sort of robots. So I think we'll be partly talking about the definition of robots. But we're going to get ourselves going with a fantastic uh, contribution from students from Wimbledon High School. Who's, who's, who's playing the music? It's great. I'm li liking it. I love a musical accompaniment. Um, so uh, can I invite the students from Wimbledon High School uh, up onto the stage? Um, and uh, tell us to tell us about a project they have been undertaking. Give them a give them a give them a big hand. Over the past term, we have been experimenting with how to use them, and we were interested in how people interacted with them in their day-to-day -day life. In our research, we found a really interesting article about how robots are being used in railway stations already in France. 
This is an example of how AI is being introduced to our daily lives. We were so curious about this idea that we wanted to compare this to the school environment. When we first introduced the robots, people found them very unfamiliar and started off by avoiding them. After we explained what they were, they treated them as a pet or a toy. However, we wanted to investigate whether we would be able to work alongside them in a school or work environment. We created this video to try and communicate our findings. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy. Thank you very much. Let's see the video. Do you feel any connection with this robot? I do because it keeps looking back to me and kind of waiting for me to say hello. So it's very sweet. Originally, I actually didn't think that I would have such a strong connection to something that is effectively just programmed and coded by someone. But it feels like a person. I don't know why, but that's just how. How might these robots affect our future? It, they'll be very helpful for, for the students and for all of us, I think, going forward, definitely. I'm sure they, they'll help, but in like a jobs point of view, they're going to take away lots of jobs from other people that, you know, can't qualify to get other jobs and they're needed, and it'll be really sad. Would you replace working people with robots? No, I wouldn't, because I think that um, people can have empathy, and I don't think you necessarily have that from a robot completely, but I do think they do have their place, but not necessarily replace them. The robots are more accurate. They can be programmed, which is also going to um, create some jobs. Thank you very much. Great stuff, great stuff. Um, we've got two great guests here. Uh, we've got Beth Singler from Cambridge University, who is uh, an anthropologist by training uh, and uh, works uh, uh, on, uh, uh, as a junior research fellow on, on AI. Uh, and uh, Sang Sok Yu, who uh, is uh, uh, teaching at uh, the HEC Business School in Paris uh, and is an expert on human-robot interaction. And we're, we're going to kick off with, with Beth, uh, uh, with, with that film as a starting point, because that kind of talks to, to, to some of what you've been thinking about. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, first of all, want to say what an absolutely fantastic film that was. Just wonderfully clear and succinct, but also very good at capturing some of the very intuitive reactions people have to robots. So the very first person featured on that film, I don't know if you noticed, it's actually sort of like scritching. It's a, mm -hmm. I don't know if people know this word, scritching, scratching. Uh, the, the robot that's sort of shaped somewhere between a rabbit and a dog. And there's that sort of reaction to it being almost animalistic and like drawing into his conception of, of the wider world. That's very, you've got like sort of an anthropological eye there in the film that I think is fantastic, but also you've got, the, these are my slides coming up, but you've got, you've got the detail of people's reaction to them and the summary of the things that we should be thinking about in, in a very short space of time. I think from a filmmaking perspective, it was absolutely excellent as well. So I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna carry on and talk about human reactions to robots, which is an anthropologist, the thing that I'm very, very, very interested in. I, I like to summarize my work sometimes by saying, I think about what you think about the machines that might think. Uh, there's a lot of mites and maybes in there, but we already have, as we have in this, this slide, so many different images of what the robot could and should be. So I'd like to start, I mean, you can see top on the, my top right, your top left, uh, an article there, slightly more dystopic, 
uh, from the uh, Daily Star about the end of the world. And uh, I like this one because they've combined not only the, the standard Terminator imagery, but they've managed to get some robot boobs in there again. And I will return to those in a moment. But uh, this is an image they've actually specifically created for this article. But often we get quite banal articles about the progress of AI, but still illustrated with the Terminator and the end of the world. And then uh, my favorite example of what I'm going to call robo-splaining, uh, top middle, <laughs> where the future will involve uh, male-looking android robots telling women what to do on computers. <laughs> I quite like that. I mean, there's absolutely no reason why there should be an android informing you. You could just have on the computer screen, you've done something wrong, kind of, you know, a modern version of Clippy. Uh, but this is, this is how we're illustrating. I mean, I, I think she's superbly glamorous as well for what she's up to, but this is, this is the imagery that we get. And then the kind of standard, as mentioned in the film, the idea about the automation of work Work, the future of the robot coming along and taking your job away from you. This again, there's no reason why there should be an anthropomorphic robot, but this is how we imagine these things. I mean, the, the, the larger picture includes more people working away and more robots coming in. And then, and then the cute robots. I mean, adorable. It's even blushing. It's wonderful. But this is this is, and I will talk about this a little bit more about how the design of robots hacks our emotions. So we have a tendency towards anthropomorphization anyway. It takes very very little for us to start considering robots as a part of our wider cosmology of beings. But when you make them cute and small, it helps. Um, sorry, I have to keep dashing around to look where I'm, I'm pointing at. Sorry, I did promise more robot boobs. We, 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 we're in the later hours, and I know there are school children around, but we can probably still mention the fact that a lot of our imaginations of the robot future involve sexy lady robots. Um, and then, of course, the dream, the aspiration, the robot, for me, certainly, uh, that again, no reason why there should be a human-shaped robot to do this. We have already the conception of the Roomba, but this is the, the vacuum-cleaning robot that's going to come along. But none of, none of these ideas are particularly new. This is what I'm very interested in, that although the term artificial intelligence doesn't really date back prior to 1956 in a particular conference, we've had these ideas of servant artificial beings for a very long time. So if this works, the magic of technology, here we go. So Aristotle, who also turned up in your wonderful film with the Aristotelian definition of friendship, Aristotle also imagined a future where our tools would be able to do their tasks without human intervention. So she, he saw this as freeing up both the masters and the slaves to a life of leisure, quite possibly, and the tool would be the artificial being. Um, but more recently, um, this carries on. Um, the concept of artificial slaves is a, a kind of a through line in some of this discussion, and, and some people take this further and start discussing, uh, or prematurely, surely, the, the idea of robot rights. But here, an article from the 1950s predicting uh, that by the 1960s, mid 1960s, slavery will be back, it says, but don't worry, because there'll be robots. That there will actually be a time in which we will have robot slaves, and the language all the way through this article, I know it's, it's particularly difficult to read, but all the language does restore some of the imagery, the harsh and dangerous imagery of slavery of African Americans. So actually one of the robots is called Jingles, which comes from Bojangles, which was one of the terrible nicknames given to African American slaves. So this, this line kind of follows through, and we've had this concept of the robot servant for a very long time. Uh, we, we also imagine this in very beneficial ways. So this is an example here of a, a robot in the care situation. Um, and for certain societies, we're increasingly aware of how much we have an elderly population, an aging population, uh, demands on our healthcare service that cannot entirely be met, met by humans. And the suggestion being that robots, and this is a gif, it will just keep repeating, um, that robots might be the solution to this, but I'm not entirely sure I want to be bathed by robots. So there's questions there about human dignity and how we interact with people when they, they reach a stage of needing care. Uh, you may have come across this robotic, uh, again, animal-esque robot. This is Paro, uh, famous more perhaps in Japan. This is a, a GIF again from uh, Japanese culture. They're, they're looking at using Paro as a sort of a, a form of emotional labor in care situations that this might be beneficial to people who uh, don't have as much interaction with humans. But again, the same sorts of questions, like what does this do to human dignity that we are more interacting with synthetic life forms than actual human beings? 
is it going to move on? And this is uh, an example, again, the animal theme keeps running through our interpretation of robots and what, uh, what makes them appealing. So these are two uh, robot things, they're called Kubo, uh, from the recent CES, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas from this year. And you can get them in two different colors. And all they basically do is, is their tails move and wag. And the advertising for this is all around, it's a Japanese country, this uh, uh, company, this idea that perhaps you don't have space or the availability of a pet, but you could have this cushion with a wagging tail. <laughs> And there's a whole a kind of range of questions about simulation and whether simulation is enough when we can't have the real thing. Does simulation somehow serve a purpose? I, I find these actually into what's known as the Uncanny Valley. Have you ever come across this idea before from Masahiro Mori in the 1970s? He said you know, that there's a certain space in which... Is this microphone not good? I can hear shouting. I'm good at shouting. Um, get closer and closer to the human but not close enough and it gives us this sense of distrust and disgust and the uncanny and actually I think to my mind these sort of fall in there because they're sort of round blobs with just tails they're not really animalistic enough they're close but not close enough um, but you know science fiction has been utilizing these sorts of uh, adorable characteristics for a long time I hope you recognize this from the Disney Pixar film, that he is designed specifically for all his sort of rust and dirt to actually be appealing for being cute and adorable, um, and you should have some sort of sentimental attachment to him. But this we know very clearly when we sit down to watch the film on DVD or we go to the cinema, we know this is science fiction, this is pretend. Like Wally presents us with the robot with agency and choice, but we know it's science fiction. But some other contemporary forms of Robots. It's not so clear when it's fact and when it's fiction. So I call these fake robots phobots. And um, if it moves on, it's going to think about it. There are other examples of phobots where the line between fact and fiction is not so clear. So this is an example of a, a computer-generated image of a robotic form. This is Adam from a Webby series, a Webby award-winning series uh, online. And this was a demonstration that the creators of Adam put on Twitter as an example of what they could do with the Unity games engine. And it's, it's fairly convincing. If I hadn't told you, perhaps, to begin with, that this was an artificial generation of a robot, you might have believed that this was a robot walking up a street, because people did. So of all people, Darren Brown was really taken in by this. Uh, it was denuded of context. The original clip, people lost the original tweet, which said that it was from a CGI creation. And people started sharing it, saying, oh my god, this is an example of an actual robot. And including Darren Brown said things like, we are all going to die. Because that line between fact and fiction often gets quite blurred. And without the original context, some people found this disturbing, again, quite un uncanny, to use Masahiro Mori's uh, term. And that line between fact and fiction is something I'm very interested in. One of the things I've been looking at is what I call Wellsian slippage, this moment when uh, robotic forms in particular and our discussion of artificial intelligence slips between truth and fiction. Uh, if you're not familiar with this incident, in 1938, Orson Welles produced a radio play of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. And... Um, it's, it's debatable quite what the actual impact was, but for, for some people, a small amount of people, perhaps not as many as uh, reported in the press at the time, this was treated as a completely factual occurrence. They heard the radio play, but they didn't realize it was fiction. They didn't realize it was H.G. Wells. And, and people panicked. They missed the adverts. And that line between fact and fiction got blurred. Uh, H, uh, Orson Welles was particularly good at this kind of performance of fiction and fact. And he kind of played on the fact that the new technology of radio enabled this. But I think this is a, a, an interesting historical parallel for some of the responses, such as Darren Brown's, oh my God, we're all gonna die tweet, responses to fictional accounts of artificial intelligence and robotics that slip into non-fiction. Another example of a phobot that I have a lot of problems with is uh, Sophia, the Hansen robot, who got a bit of a mention at the beginning. She actually, she didn't get a full citizenship of Saudi Arabia. She got honorary citizenship of Saudi Arabia. 
Um, and if you, if you see this, this GIF here, she has done many uh, public appearances. She's been on the Jimmy Fallon show. She's been on the front cover of Style magazine. She's had makeovers. And she did, yes, yeah, she went on a date with Will Smith. Um, she turned him down, according to this. You know, she friend-zoned him, not a term I particularly like. But uh, this representation of Sophia, who to all accounts, and I have consulted with chatbot experts, she's very little more than a puppet. There is a certain element of performance to her. Her responses are often scripted. Sometimes her movements are managed by people off screen. There, there is definitely a fictional element to her, but she's presented as a non-fictional account of a, a contemporary advanced robot. As you know, she speaks at the UN and people are said to take attention to her. So I think it's very concerning when these lines between fact and fiction are blurred when we consider what we think the robot is. So when, it's, it, when it comes to imagining the future and this nice idea of the servant robot who's going to do all our tasks for us, we have to be very careful we're not sucked into the fictional account. As in here, this is a very old cartoon. Some of us will recognize it, some of us won't. Uh, from the Jetsons, where you know, they, they had the robot maids and they had the servant class robot that could do everything for us. It's actually not going to be very much like that. You might have the Roomba scooting around the room, but it's not going to be the human-looking robot pushing the hoover around. What's actually quite concerning is the invisibility of robots and artificial intelligence in our lives. And I think actually the future will be closer to this more abstract illustration of the connectedness of, of uh, technology. And actually we should be concerned about the robots we can't see rather than the ones that we can see. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Um, just before I, we, we move on, uh, Another great example of Phobots, there was a, a House of Commons committee, mm. uh, select committee, which had uh, a hearing on robots, and they had Pepper, who is an interesting robot, yes. who gave evidence to the committee. Is that, is that a, that's a bad thing, isn't it? That that's is, that, yeah, no, I remember that. That's a particularly bad thing, because the, 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 the narrative that comes through that robot is not the decision of the robot. It's the decision of the script writers behind the robot, the creators of the robot, the users of the robot. So if you're trying to source evidence... We're, we're gen generally creating a, a false narrative about mm. the capabilities of these Absolutely. devices and what they're for. And, and to my mind, that distracts us from the actual capabilities mm. of uh, machine learning intelligence that can distract us and lead us into a society that we're not prepared for. Yeah. Great. Uh, we're going to debate all these things in a moment, but first we can hear from Sansok Yu. Uh, now, you're, uh, you're, looking about, uh, you're looking at the, the way we, uh, we see robots in more in a sort of professional spaces, how, mm -hmm. how we interact with them at work, in the factory, and so on. Right. So, um, can I have the yes. clicker? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh. yeah. Uh, by the way, my presentation is uh, going to be pretty short and concise. Um, I just want to show you a couple of pictures. I think uh, these pictures are around um, like internet uh, pretty while. And you know, I just want to say how we interact with robots are qualitatively different from how we used to interact with uh, other traditional technologies like computers, laptops, and your smartphones, right? So um, imagine um, how you use computers, like you use keyboard, you use mouse, and then very advanced way, you use a VR headset. I mean, that's um, kind of like more advanced way. But um, we are like, interacting with robots by hug them, petting them, touching them, feeding them, like something like that. So this is because robots have like physical bodies. I think this is what makes robots robots, right? But this physical... Um, yeah, the one slide is missing, actually. Um, I was going to show you um, like a scene from my actual experiment that uh, the participants were uh, interacting with the robot to uh, perform a collaborative task. Um, I used the Lego robots, you know, Mindstorms. Uh, it's pretty simple toy um, assembl uh, assembled robot. I mean, I, I think it's pretty much like used widely in high schools and then K-12 you know, education uh, for STEM education. Um, I use, I, I build a simple robot. I mean, that doesn't have any like intelligence or um, you know, artificial intelligence and stuff like that. But in the task, the people were asked to 
move the five water bottles from point A to point B and point C as quickly as possible by controlling those robots. And I found that you know, even with these simplistic robots, the people were uh, pretty much strongly emotionally attached to those robots. Um, for example, you know, before uh, interacting with the robots, they, they call them just it. Like, oh, it is pretty small, it is pretty simple, and then how it can uh, move the water bottle and stuff like that. But after, like, very brief interaction, um, I don't think it lasted, like, more than an hour. I, it's, it, it was, like, a bit less than an hour. Um, after this brief interaction, I, we observed that, like, the people call them, um, like, he or she. So it's a pretty much, like, a sheer evidence that you know, the people project personality, uh, intention, Values. I mean, those all human-like characteristics to those robots. So, um, you know, this is pretty strong tendency uh, that we have uh, towards these physically embodied objects, and then we can see this like pretty much wide variety of different um, like types of robots. Um, you know, that I, I think uh, the physical embodiment, and then human nature, and then human minds toward the robot that could be. Uh, pretty much like a good key uh, to solving the problems that we have um, um, about the having the robots in our workplaces. You know, as you can see here, uh, you know, th these, the orange box shaped uh, device, um, this is a robot uh, that was deployed to an Amazon warehouse, and then Amazon uh, is actually investing a lot of money and resource to uh, build this kind of robots. And then they um, established the company, Amazon Robotics, and then they sell this robot to uh, you know, warehouse and the logistics companies. And then, you know, it's pretty cool, right? This small robot can carry around uh, like very heavy uh, stuff, They're very effective, and then all this warehouse has uh, little markers so that uh, these robots can navigate, like no collision. It's very effective. And then you can, the, and one warehouse only needs a few people, like this man. I mean, this is a problem for, um, for us, especially blue collar workers, right? So it can drastically reduce the number of people who are necessary for uh, running these warehouses, right? So I would say, you know, there is a growing fear among human workers, especially blue-collar workers, that robots are going to take our jobs, right? I think uh, this photo is pretty much nicely depicting what is happening or what is going to happen in our workplaces, right? So this robot looks pretty grumpy, right? So, um, like, uh, it doesn't like anything, and then it uh, directs this person to go home, and then there are actually people going home, Right? So the people may be uh, directed by a robot, and then they actually have to go home losing their jobs. But you know, this kind of fear and all sorts of uh, negative feelings towards robots is pretty problematic um, for individual workers and the companies as well. So for example, this negative attitude towards robots and then these negative feelings um, can lead to um, poor mental well-being and low job performance and then even high turnover rate, right? So it is pretty, like, you know, an important problem for organization to survive. So I think what we have to solve in the future by having robots and adopting robots in our workplaces uh, is to build a cohesive workforce. Like that um, consists of like both human and robot. You know, um, a lot of people believe that robots will take our places and then people will be replaced by the robots in the near future. But uh, to be honest, I don't think it's gonna be pretty near future. Maybe it won't happen at all. Um, I think it's going to be more like robots will be working with us. So maybe this kind of fear is not real maybe this kind of fear is not going to be realized. But it's actually the fact that 
uh, the sheer fact that the blue collar workers are having this fear and um, not so much about these robots are not. So the companies and the researchers have to think about the, how we nicely integrate these robots to our workplaces. And then as a solution for this kind of problem, as I was um, like talking about before, you know, hacking the human minds and then how we interact with uh, robots and then how we behave with robots and then studying about those, like this would be pretty much good key to solve this problem. That's pretty much it for my, my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let, I think we've got a definition problem here. Can we agree what is a robot? Mm -hmm. uh, wh wh how do you define a robot? Um, first of all, I, I should admit that the robots, the term, is very loaded. Um, you know, uh, even among roboticists and then even among the scholars who study robots, the definition of robots are not actually converging. So what I would def define uh, the robot. Um, robots usually uh, can move and can manifest They've intelligence. They've got to be able to move. Yeah, there are, so mobility. I, I, will, uh, I will point you towards uh, Fiat factories 30 odd years ago, right. packed with robots. Those robots are in cages, they never move. Right, so they, they exactly. you know, punch, punch holes in metal. Yeah, so uh, th that's a, a pretty difficult spot to mm. discuss because you know the, the word robot has been used for uh, quite a long time, like from the era of automation. So, you know, be careful that, you know, I use the term automation. So automation was from like, um, like 1970s or 60s, like the, the, the machine that you just uh, mentioned, yeah. Yeah. like uh, the like heavy duty arms mm. in the automobile factory. I mean, they are robots, mm. but you know, we are facing like different types of robots, right? I mean, those kind of robots are not going to be in our home, and then those are not going to be interacting with us. You know, like automation, like heavy duty robots, or um, those kind of machines. So, well, um, I mean, they are, uh, you know, like humans are not present. Like, you know. That is changing in factories. They're now developing things called cobots, which mm -hmm. uh, uh, workers are encouraged to interact with. Uh, do you think a definition matters, Beth? Uh, well, when it comes to the word robot, it's 100 years and four mm. days old mm. in its popular conception since Carol Chepek's uh, play R.U.R. is mm. now 100 years old from yeah. 1920s, that he used the Czech word robota, or roboti for plural, mm. meaning serf, mm -hmm. as in servant, in the feudal mm. system. So we have an origin for the term where it was applied specifically to a story about factory workers synthetically formed out of actually bioorganic matter rather than metal. The metal robot predated Carol Chapik and actually occurs after. But the, it, the, it comes with all that baggage that you're talking about, that we have this conception of what the robot is. And I actually think it's very interesting that we don't have a single definition, that actually it's a very slippery term where, I, was, I think I was saying to you earlier, that um, I get asked what I do sometimes and I say I, I research AI and some people say, oh, well, artificial insemination. Mm. <laughs> but you say robot, yeah. they know because they have this literacy in the science fiction of what a robot is. And I've given talks at schools to quite young children and you say, which robots do you know? And they already know films they shouldn't have ever watched at sort mm. of seven years old, but they know the Terminator and they know, the, you mm. know they even know Cyborg, so they know that distinction as well. So we're fed a diet of what the robot is before any kind of technical definition. And that's what's very interesting to me, that even if it's a very slippery term, it can be applied in very many different ways. Now, the, the two extremes of what, what you, you've, uh, you, the two of you have shown us are the, the Amazon robot, which is a purely practical device, right. uh, and uh, the, the, f the furry creatures, mm. where, and, and also the, the, the slightly uncanny valley uh, <coughs> I, I think that the Uncanny Valley is, is not those furry creatures, but uh, uh, the, the, the one that's been given Saudi citizenship. So, Sophia, so, Sophia, yeah. Sophia, Sophia. It's very, um, it's very subjective, so Uncanny Valley yeah. varies for different people. Um, what, does it, what does it say that 
despite the fact that it seems to me that where robots are really entering our lives is in the Amazon warehouse in a purely pra practical form, that we are seeing this whole rash of uh, kind of humanoid robots uh, whose function to me at the moment is pretty unclear. Yes, yeah, so for some people creating robotic entities, uh, there is a line of history that they want to follow, that they see a sort of ex accelerationist view of what the future will be like. And that is also fed by science fiction accounts of we'll walk down the street alongside robots. Mm -hmm. So they want to get to that by creating things now that bring us closer to that future, that not quite here yet future. So Sophia is a perfect example of what I call manifested aspiration, that people want this thing to exist. So they make Sophia and pretend that she's more advanced than she actually but is. They're also, they, they have got uses as a kind of manifestation of how far artificial intelligence research has come. You want, for instance, you, I mean, one of the, 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 the big developments in artificial intelligence has been computer vision, mm. com a computer that you know, knows the difference between a cat and a dog, and I suppose, almost in PR terms, you build something that looks like a, a human to, to kind of explain that to people. In the case of Sophia, it's not so clear that she can do no. that kind of recognition right. yeah. at all. So, I mean, I, I leave her to one side mm. for a moment. But yes, yeah, so some of the examples of machine vision, there, there's no robotic form attached to that at all. They're actually using just sensors and just output mm. systems. So it's not apparent that that's key, but you're absolutely right. It, it, it draws more attention if you talk about AI and creativity and you create a robot that can paint mm -hmm. than if you just talked about a program that painted something. So yeah, it, it is about getting eyeballs on the, the story that you want it's to tell. capturing the imagination. Absolutely, and yeah. again, drawing on the science fiction that's so rich and so, so valuable in its own right, but can mislead us to where we are now. Um, in terms of the huge wave of investment that's gone into this area. Do you understand why s a lot of that investment does seem to be going into these uh, humanoid uh, mm -hmm. robots? Uh, I, I, I didn't go this year, but I go year after year to CES, the show in Las Vegas, and every year there has been uh, a, another of these cute humanoid robots. Right. The, 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 the French one, uh, Pepper, uh, has been a, a constant visitor mm -hmm. uh, and seems to be uh, I've, I'm beginning to feel sorry for Pepper because she, yeah, she turns up, she gives evidence to that House of Commons Select Committee. Uh, she's quite cute. Uh, she's got a nice voice. And I'm calling her she, you notice. Um, but she still seems to me to be desperate for a proper role. So why is that investment all going there? What, what is driving it? So you think the robot was desperate or the company was desperate? But a or bit of both, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I don't think the robot was desperate, no. Yeah. no. So, you know, um, I totally agree with you about um, like the fundamental reasons that humans want to build a robot that looked like a human. So like Sophia. So people obviously want those kind of robots to exist. So uh, that, that may be, uh, you know, like we may have to go back to like a hu fundamental human desire or something. But the, from practical standpoint, you know, a design matters a lot. So for example, we want to build a robot that can paint. So of course, human arm. So if a robot that looks like a human arm, that may not be necessary, right? So it's not efficient, it's not effective to move around the brushes and the colors and everything. But, you know, robots are interacting with people. And then humans have feelings and then, like, minds, right? So the designs. Like, for example, if the robot that looks like the human mind or, or the human face or that speaks natural language or um, have a gesture with two arms or stuff like that, so that actually lowers the psychological barriers for people to interact with the robots and then it can increase like positive feelings and to uh, attitudes towards them. So that why is kind of like... Have, why do we need to have positive attitudes to robots? This is an interesting question. Why we uh, don't I need... don't have a positive attitude to um, my, uh, my washing machine. I, I like it, but I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't love it. Uh, I don't want to take it on a date. Yeah. Um, why do we need to have a positive rela relationship with a robot? I want to ask a question, why not? And then, you know, 
I mean, we are already observing a lot of cases where we don't have like positive attitudes or feelings toward the machine. So for example, you know, uh, I just want to ask a question to you that your perception toward your washing machine is purely based on the functionality. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, we don't. We, I mean, for we, example, we, we, you know. we never talk. We never, you know. Yeah, I know. The, the relationship is, is is going nowhere. I have to tell you. I know. Uh, okay, I know. Yeah, yeah. That's. I, I'm glad. I'm glad. Well, my, my my I'm glad my wife's not here because she will say I'm <laughs> I'm unusually cold and distant towards the washing machine. Yeah. Um, you know what I'm saying is like the aesthetic uh, aspect or the design aspect. So uh, that actually matters a lot. So it's pretty natural, right? So, I mean, for example, you want to choose a phone, like, mm -hmm. right? And for example, um, like when you, um, like for example, let's, uh, let's uh, imagine this kind of situation. So you have an Alexa and then Google Assistant and Apple Siri, right? But you know, they are all female, but somehow, you know, maybe you, you have noticed that they want to um, have, like, positive attention from you, like, maybe, right? So just by having attractive female voice, um, or um, they try to be, like, festive in their tones and then vocabularies and then sound and something like that. So uh, this is about, like, how human minds work. And then this is about like how humans interact with machines, and then which is pretty much based on how we interact with each other among humans, right? So, from this standpoint, like having a human-like design or appearance for the robots, you know, it it is a good thing. I mean, in terms of like um, having so people Amazon more. So Amazon is making a mistake with that robot, you would say, because that robot mm -hmm. does not have. Uh, I think they could do they capacity. could do better. So, for example, right. you know, um, for example, like the the guy in this photo. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, whatever. You can never go back. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, he doesn't look happy. I mean, like he looks pretty neutral. I, I know. <laughs> So what you're telling me is if you painted a smiley face on that, you'd suddenly be happy. <laughs> but, but, but like outside this example, so for example, you know, uh, there's a robot called Baxter, uh, yeah. which was developed for uh, Cobot, like collaborative robotics. Um, you know, it has like two arms and then one display um, with cameras. And then this robot was designed uh, to be working alongside humans. Um, so the robot can stop immediately uh, as soon as it recognizes like human touch uh, in, in the vicinity or something like that. But you know, the, what the, f the funny thing is about the robot is um, it has a little two eyes. It constantly showing two eyes and the facial expressions in this dis display. Right, so you know, I mean, it's it may not be um, like directly about the performance, mm. but it's a human mind, right? So by having these two eyes, like humans, may be a little bit more happier, or like less stressed out, or like lowering their barriers to interact with the robots. Beth, let's bring you in. I mean, I'm ju I'm dubious about uh, the the need for the, those industrial robots to. To, to look human, but the, the whole point of some of the ones that you've been talking about is that they are, they're, they're called companion robots. Mm. Where's that going? I mean, is, is that a, um, uh, a useful part? I, I, I've got, again, doubts about how, how companionable and how um, useful they are. Yeah, so I, I, I kind of get sense in the audience, someone there gets an idea of where companion robots could be going. There's a sort of like a slight laugh there, but there's, yeah. so, there's so much I want to respond to actually mm. in, in the yeah. comments just made that, uh, I mean, the whole 
gendered aspect of some of those AI assistants needs to be addressed that you're saying that they're making them more companionable, but they're making them more companionable in a specific gender. Where, and you're talking about the design, but the actual design of the unit that the voice comes out of has right. nothing to do with anthropomorphism at all. It's usually quite blocky. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think it's interesting, interesting that we've got this assumption that the future will bring us robots in particular designs and the companionship element uh, can go down, as in my first slide, into the direction that people are assuming we're gonna end up with sexy lady robots in particular and there are people working on the technology for sex robots, and I'm not a sex robots expert by any means, and other people are much better, like Kate Devlin, but I think it's very interesting that this is a part of our imagination, that we will end up again with a form of emotional labor, servitude, sexual labor as well, included in that, through, through this technology, and that I think to a certain extent you're right, we do pattern our technology on things we're already familiar with, but it doesn't have to necessarily be the Android robot. So in, in connecting with our technology through our phones or through our computers, some of the ways in which the data is stored and presented replicates non-computer interfaces. So we have folders and we have the save icon for, for people in my generation and in your generation perhaps, um, the, the save icon being the three and a half inch disc. Most mm -hmm. younger yeah. people <laughs> don't recall yeah. re uh, saving things so on those discs. Is that what's called skeuomorphism? I forget. I, yeah. I forget yeah. the yeah. term, yeah. but yes, yeah, so we use symbols that to us, recogni we recognize those mm. as, as and, and that's one argument for saying that robots should be symbolic of things we're familiar with and that could be the human form. Mm. But it doesn't really serve always the purpose of the robot, whereas mm. the folder on the computer does serve the purpose of saving things mm. in a different way. So I, I'm skeptical about, and certainly is skeptical when it comes to the Amazon robot. I don't think it would help the person working there to have a smiley face mm. on the robot at all. I don't think there's actually much interaction going on mm. between that gentleman who looks not very happy and the robot. And I think actually he's not very happy, not because there's a robot working there, but because he's being treated like a robot. Mm. And literally Amazon workers have protested with signs saying, I am not a robot because mm. they get very few breaks. They have to reach outrageous standards of performance. Mm. And the counter to anthropomorphization of robots is actually robomorphization of humans, mm. that we treat humans more and more like machines and make them replaceable. So that's, that's a deep concern to, my, to me. And I'm not sure actually just adding smiley faces does anything to sort that out. Um, and what... <laughs> <laughs> My fans are here. So. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're fantastic. We're, we're in, a, in a moment, we're going to have a QA. and I just want to ask you one more, one more thing. Um, have you looked at, uh, th there's, particularly in Japan, there, there is, and you, 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 you kind of mentioned this, there is this idea that uh, in an aging society, um, uh, the uh, robots could be the answer to, to care in, 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 in a home. I mean, I, I, I saw one thing which really horrified me, which was a robot that was going to be, uh, was sold as this will look after people with dementia. Uh, and it, it's a smiley face. And if the person with dementia tells the same story a hundred times, a human might lose their rag. The robot yeah. never will. Um, this, this is kind of worrying stuff, isn't it? Yeah, so I, I raised the question of human dignity, and this is a big question that all societies will have to consider because this is going to affect all societies, that we will end up, because of our increased health uh, conditions, that we will end up with increasingly with ageing populations. And Japan, um, stereotypically, we assume this is the country where it's almost the test case already. We're seeing this happening. They have uh, more social robots in the healthcare system than anywhere else it appears and there's lots of assumptions made about why that is and why Japanese culture is different um, and there's lots of very reductionist arguments about their history of Shinto and Buddhism and actually we also in the so-called West have all these traditions of spirits and, and uh, animated beings in, in equal ways but I think what's very interesting is that 
for, for some people who are coming out of that culture, and I'm not saying this personally, but I have heard this said by people from the Japanese culture and the Asian culture more widely, there are reasons beyond just the aging population that there's actually concerns about immigration. And talking about the blue-collar workers, um, in America, a lot of the blue-collar wor workers are more concerned about immigration than robots coming in and automating labor. And that's a narrative that's being pushed from the top. We know in the Trumpian government that they have over there, this is something that's repeated again and again. And it's, so it's not simply that there's an aging population and robots are the answer. There's lots of different narratives and threads and tensions at play that we can't just simply summarize quite often with a sort of weird techno-orientalism that says Japanese people are doing these things because they like spirits. Okay, um, it's time for some interaction. With, uh, you're not an audience of robots, we've already established that. Uh, and we've got, we've got a question here and then after that, there's a question there. Good evening. Uh, why are people so worried about robots today, right? We had robots a century ago in the countryside. It did wonderful things for humanity. It freed up a lot of people instead of 80% finding, you know, spending all their time bringing up their food and everything. Now they can do other things and humanity went to the next level. Why do we suddenly worry that it's not going to happen again? It's a good question. I mean, do we worry? Uh, there, there, there's been a lot of alarmism about jobs, and actually, mm -hmm. I think a lot of the, the economics behind that has been shown to be quite shaky. Um, why do we worry about that? And then, you know, I, I want to re revisit this question, and then I want to revisit the topic of, like, living with robots now. So because, you know... Uh, it looks like, I mean, to me, like Beth and I are uh, talking about like slightly different things, right? So, I mean, I am actually talking about like robots as like inevitable change in our lives. I mean, but not every facet of life. Like, I mean, the, the areas that we can adopt robots, for example, workplaces and the factories and some homes, like lonely people. Um, like therapeutic uh, purpose for autistic children, uh, those kind of uh, areas. I mean, we can actually welcome robots and then some designs of the robots and then research on how we interact with robots can actually benefit our lives. But, you know, some um, discussion on adoption of robots in our lives, I mean, sometimes I feel that um, it's like threatening the whole human dignity, right? So, I mean, of course, like it can be like a huge threat to a human dignity and a human existence or something like that. But I think we, we may have to tease out um, the cases, right? So uh, where we can actually use and then benefit from uh, adopting those robots and then uh, other cases that can um, be um, like pretty negative about having the robots. I, 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 I don't, uh, maybe uh, it would be an answer or, yeah. Let's just or, quick, yeah. Quick, quick word from Beth. Yeah, so we, we have a, a long sceptical history of our relationship with machines and often if you say you're a bit worried about the incoming influx of robots that you're some sort of neo-Luddite because the Luddites rebelled against things like the spinning jenny and threw them in rivers and your example of sort of uh, 100 years ago, what were we dealing with? We weren't really dealing with tractors but... There, there was a period of time where we increasingly saw that we could mechanize farming in particular and reduce the need for human labor. Prior to that, we had horse labor, and we had horses for transport, and we had horses for leisure as well. Um, and now I just sort of quickly want to ask, how many people here own a horse? <laughs> Yeah, so that we reached peak horse at one point. I was, I'm, we, I'm staying nearby, and there's lots of muse houses. Now, muse houses started as the stabling for horses in the center of towns, and now they're very, very, very expensive properties. So we move on from the horse. We reach peak horse, and where the question is, are we also necessarily reaching peak human? Because physical labor will be automated, but also intellectual labor and emotional labor with the examples of the robots that hack our emotional um, uh, states and do work that we previously thought humans could do. So this is this is the concern, and I don't necessarily fall ultimately down into a neo-Luddite position, but we should have these conversations because you're right, we should talk about where we should and shouldn't use automation and where it's appropriate and where it isn't. But that conversation isn't necessarily being have, had here. It's being have, had at the corporate level or even the state level, and we need to think about who the players in that are. Now... Uh, we had a question in the front. Uh, uh, we've got a microphone coming. 
Robots aren't self-conscious, at least what we know of so far, but does something which has rights need to be self-conscious? And do you need to be self-conscious in order to have rights? Oh my goodness. That, <laughs> that is an amazing question. I love it. That's brilliant. That's a, that's a question for you. Okay. You're, you're the only one here. <laughs> Uh, so you're absolutely right. You don't have to be conscious to have rights. Uh, we apply rights to many different things. More recently, we've applied rights to rivers, to mountains, indigenous cultures that respect those uh, geographical forms. We, we, we've accepted that there should be rights applied. We do apply rights to animals who, you know, debates about consciousness in various different forms of the animal kingdom do continue. So it's a good point, but my concern is that we focus on robot rights too soon. Uh, because perhaps someone can program a robot that says, please give me rights, when it's nowhere even near conscious or needing rights, and we ignore the rights of those things and people that require them now. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite concerned about where our attention goes. And I say that as someone who spends a lot of time talking about robots, and I want to carry on talking about robots, but there are other things happening in the world as well. Um, I, I think we've got time for one more question. Have we, have we got a microphone coming? <laughs> Pass it on. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering, it's been a bit negative about robots, but um, the concept of embodiment and the fact that uh, clearly we're learning quite a lot about how humans work from particularly medical applications of robotic arms. I mean, if you've um, lost, you know, a, a, a limb in, uh, in war, then you know clearly what you really want is a perfectly functioning repli replica. Are, are we not learning from robotics how the human uh, haptic skill can be replaced? Yeah, I, I, bef before before uh, before this event, we were having a chat, and I was talking about having met uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, who gave me a great uh, warning about the the potential for. Uh, robots uh, to to make us obsolete, but he 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 was using robotic technology in some ways to to communicate. So um, there is some exciting stuff out there, isn't there? That, yeah, that can augment us. I mean, well, there is a question about the difference between therapy and therapeutic uses and augmentation. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, the applications you're talking about are therape therapeutic uses mm. and absolutely we should we should explore technology for all its benefits while bearing in mind where we might take things too far. <laughs> Augmentation and cyborgism and transhumanism is a whole other discussion about where we want humanity as a whole to end up. But it would be great to think every single technological use could be applied to therapeutic uses, but I, I spent some time going around an engineering department a year or two back, and they showed me this lower half exoskeleton. And I was like, fantastic, if people you know, who can't walk for various reasons are in wheelchairs, they could use that, they could end up walking. They said, no, we're actually the first commercial use will be in a factory to keep workers standing up for longer. Oh, so we need to think about the ethical implications, even if the technology itself could be applied for good. We need to be pushing for that. And a quick positive thought. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Um, you know, the, that's why we need robotic uh, ethics. And then, you know, I think um, like lawmakers, the law scholars, um, you know, uh, ethics uh, scholars, they are like really actively engaging in this topic as well with the uh, very active conferences. Um, but in terms of the human rights, um, uh, the robot rights, I, I also agree that is pretty too soon to uh, discuss uh, that. But you know, um, in the end, I think like robot rights um, have to be about the human rights. So uh, the, by treating robots badly, uh, you know, humans feel something bad, and then it can be extended to uh, how they treat human other humans. I mean, that is a kind of like a threat to our human rights as well. So you know. I mean, I think it's a, it's good to think about robot rights, but you know, human rights should be at the center of that discussion as well, in the long run. Well, we've run out of time. Can I make the point? I am the only person on stage, as far as I know, who is augmented. I actually had a chip inserted in me four years ago to get into an office block in Sweden, uh, where they were talking about uh, giving everybody a chip uh, instead of a pass. So I am 
the only part robot on the stage. But um, uh, as far as you as know, as far as I know, as far as I know, um, thank you. It's been a fascinating discussion. We could go on for hours, but I think there are drinks out there, and um, I wouldn't fun. like to keep people back from them. So thank you very much to our panel. Thank you. So a massive thank you. So the drinks will be after the concert, so you're going to have to stay a little bit longer. Uh, so a massive thank you for that great debate on robots and, and linkage to artificial intelligence. You didn't talk about RPA, which is the robotic process intelligence, which is, you know, taking uh, automation, sorry, which is taking a lot of the white colour jobs as well, but maybe for another year. So thank you very much, Rory, Beth, and Sang... Suck. Thank you very much. Um, so please stay. So as I said, we're going to have the concert in this room, uh, and then some people are going to join us from the Mediatek. What? Take you to the artist. Oh, sorry. Oh, Kemi. Oh, Kemi. That. Thank you very much, Kemi. Could you maybe just give us a, your view of the clothes? Um, so, yeah, I just thought that I should draw an image about us human and robots living happily ever after. So this is what I've come up with. hope you like it. <laughs> Thank you, Kemi. Sorry. Um, so we are going... I just want to do a very quick wrap-up as well because... You know, it's called the Night of Ideas, and it's called the Night of Ideas because it goes for a few hours. And, and if you remember, you know, at the start, where Tildar talked to us about the art of thinking, he talked to us about uh, how we're going to be engaging on conversations. And for me, whether it was about getting a number of people engaging with whales, whether it's um, philosophers, whether it's scientists, that brought to me passion of people for one subject and talking to each other. Um, if you talk, how many of you have gone to the VR virtual reality uh, hub earlier? No, nobody in this room. But you know, you could get into the space of somebody else in the body of somebody else through virtual reality. Um, I'm going to change my shoes and you know get some of those uh, sustainable shoes. So and definitely be more aware as to what we're wearing and why we're wearing it. Um, the debate around artificial intelligence, you know, clearly brings a lot of questions around our use of data and what we want to do. And then the linkage with the actual robots, you know, brings all of this together and, and again, many, many debates. So I'm going to ask Alice as well to come on stage. So we're going to get the, um, the piano on stage. Oh, you don't have a, a mic. She's getting a mic. So Alice, Alice has been part of the core team and we met, I think it was last year, as we were planning for the Night of Ideas. Um, and she was explaining to me everything that goes on in the background and how do we come to a night that brings so many bright people talking about all of these subjects. So maybe I'll ask Alice to give us just a, a couple of seconds as to how do you come up with all, all of these ideas and, and what goes behind the scene? So first of all, I would like, because Mach has been here, this is his third year, and he never gets his thanks. Okay, <laughs> so if I could please ask you for a round of applause for our wonderful MC. Thank you. He's been doing a fantastic job for all those years. So many thanks Thank you to very you. Much. Many thanks to the audience, obviously. Uh, and yes, so a lot of work goes into the making of this night of ideas. Everything from thinking about what we're going to be talking about to who we're going to invite in order to talk about this to all the wonderful work that you are seeing here before your very eyes that goes into changing the scenery whenever we go from talk to concert. Because one of the main points of the night of ideas is debating those topics in as many languages as we can. So that is why we have talks, we have performances, we have concerts, uh, so that 
through this, in this way, we hope to enable you to get to the topics that we are dealing with through whichever way you want, uh, through whichever way you like best, or maybe getting you through an entry that you didn't think you'd be taking and discovering that um, you're more fascinated by the concert than by the talk, whereas initially you wanted to go and see the talk, but you couldn't get in because it was full. Um, as you might notice, I'm kind of slightly trying to keep your attention <laughs> while the setup is being done, which I think should be pretty soon. And we will be welcoming Riopi uh, for a wonderful concert, Tree of Life, um, which will be the perfect ending to this amazing night. And you can even stay on after that because it just never ends. And so after the concert, there will be a free drink in the lobby of the French Institute. So if and we have a few of our panelists and staff coming over, so all this is wonderful to listen to the concert. So in terms of um, if people have ideas about things we should be talking about next year, how do they go about feeding those ideas for you? So the first thing that they can do is write to the Institut Francais Paris, who gives us our theme every oh, year. Oh, right. But okay. that's the general theme that's alive. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the Institute is present in all social networks. So if you have ideas for the Night of Ideas, just feed them into that. And uh, we'll take them into account, provided we can fit them in that very vast tent. But as you see, you know, this night's theme was alive. So, you know you can have a lot of various themes within that. So how many people did we have contributing into the, uh, the actual event? Oh, so the staff is numerous and precious and very, very impressive tonight. Um, I couldn't give you figures because I'm not very good with figures and it's very late, but it's a lot of people. <laughs> They're all great. You've met some of them tonight. <laughs> And, you had, and you they're had still a lot of circulating helpers as well, the hallways of the Institute. And you had loads of helpers. And we had loads of helpers for tonight. So yes, some of them are in this room. And so I would like to thank, of course, the staff, but also all the wonderful volunteers that have helped us uh, throughout this night. Uh, we have students from neighboring universities. We have former interns of the French Institute who are so fond of us that they come back for the Night of Ideas. Uh, and all kinds of people helping out. And we are extremely grateful to them because we obviously could not do such an event without them. Can you actually play the piano? I cannot play the piano at all. I used to play the violin, to be honest. Um, so I will not attempt it, especially since it's a very good piano. It's a Steinway, and I wouldn't want to do anything to mess it up. Good. She can sing. I can sing, but I am not going to oh. sing. <laughs> no way. <laughs> can she sing and can she dance? Uh, dancing <laughs> is debatable. <laughs> good. I think we've got a few people coming in. We still have a few people coming in, which wanna, we can't see very well. Yeah. Do you want to try to get a seat? So hopefully, you know, the piano is getting ready. Yeah, we should. And we can uh, be get set up soon. Very soon to the, uh, the end of our And evening. we will then, at some point, maybe, stop talking. Yeah, we'll stop talking. <laughs> which might be a relief for a lot of people here. <laughs>
today. And we are welcoming back our cultural counselor and our ambassador wearing t beautiful t-shirts <laughs> of the Night of Ideas. Are they sustainable? <laughs> are they sustainable? Size. <laughs> so I think we'll set up waiting for the artist Rio P2 to the Tree of Life. So, I think with further ado, I'd like to invite Rio P on stage. Um, bonsoir. <laughs> and I think before we, get, before we get too excited, I think you're going to do a little bit of testing of the piano to make sure they all work. So, uh, and then we'll start the concert. Uh, can we also thank our master of ceremony, Mark Benar? He did the whole evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And that's the third edition, so he's part of the family. Thank you very much. Are we all good? All good. All good. So, over to you.
Practice goes on and in a sense of I know this but I just want to really hear it and feel it. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank, absolutely beautiful. Can I ask a couple of questions? Because I sat here. I mean, it, what a wonderful way to finish the theme today on what does it mean to be alive and seeing the tree. And so what I'd love to know is how do you get your inspiration? How do you go about sitting and composing? That's like a 24 hours debate. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's very interesting because I actually... Uh, I mean, I think it's interesting that the brain to find where the source is. So basically, I'm really interested in how do you get to that point, this kind of point of consciousness that we probably heard about, you know? Yeah. And when we find it, then it just flows. You know, 
long. That's the very short. It just flows. <laughs> <laughs> you make it sound really easy. For us, for me, definitely touched me and uh, absolutely loved it. So thank you very much. <laughs> I'm going to ask Claudine to come on stage to close the evening. So the last few words before we go for a, a few drinks. Merci Marc. Juste pour vous dire que nous avons un petit verre d'amitié euh, pour ceux qui veulent le partager. Donc euh, ça sera dans le hall. Et par ailleurs, je voudrais vraiment remercier toute l'équipe euh, de la Nuit des Idées qui a donné beaucoup, qui est enthousiaste et qui croit vraiment à ce moment de, de dialogue dont on parlait en début de matinée. Je, suis, je parle en français parce que ce soir, nous parlons en français. Voilà, donc merci beaucoup, merci à Alice, euh, en particulier Alice Béja, je ne sais pas où elle est, qui nous a vraiment beaucoup, beaucoup aidé dans toute euh, cette euh, organisation et à toutes les personnes de l'équipe, nous aurons l'occasion avec Madame l'ambassadrice euh, de nous réunir tous ensemble et euh, de parler de ce moment historique, puisqu'il en est un, et joyeux. Et ce n'était pas forcément évident euh, compte tenu du contexte général. Donc merci beaucoup à votre fidélité et à très bientôt. Thank you very much.